The following broadcast is intended for mature audiences. These are real people sharing very real, deeply personal experiences. This content may be considered triggering for others and for those who are sharing. The chat room is a privilege intended for discussions and sharing. You are not being asked to agree, but you are being asked to stay civil and refrain from personal attacks. Listener discretion is advised. All right, welcome back to Am I Mental? A live weekly podcast where real people share real stories about living lives with mental health issues and things that impact their mental health. I'm your host, E, and with us as always is our co-host, Bexy. Hi. And also the co-host, C, who fell off, apparently. Oh, they're coming back in. <laughs> I was busy looking at another screen, so I missed that the C fell off. So go ahead and say hello, C. Hello. So this week... We did it. We finally did it. We have a guest from across the pond. So, um, without super further exciting. Ado, yeah, it is very <laughs> exciting. And I got to admit, I love the Irish accent. I really do. I've been, I have been <laughs> one, like cloud nine this whole time. Going, we're going to have a guest with an Irish accent. We're going to have a guest with an Irish accent. <laughs> so, I love it too. Yeah. So, um, we have, uh, Ify, right? Ifa, yeah. Ifa, no, Ifa. I'll take that. That's that's a good approximation. Yeah, the spelling is. Yeah, I never would have guessed. Just no, <laughs> no. The spelling and no, no. It just if you're coming from an English speaking background, it just it won't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. No. I may maybe a Welsh or Gaelic background. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's Gaelic. In Gaelic, the A O I. So it's spelled A O I F E, and in Gaelic, the A O I is just pronounced E. And uh, yeah. Sorry about that. No, don't be sorry. That's an awesome name. I love it. <laughs> Plus, you're carrying on your heritage with your name. That's awesome. That is. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I think it's a name that hasn't quite made it over, though, To because some Irish names have really made it over to the States. I remember when I was there, you'd hear Kira's and Siobhan's and Sean's and things like that. Uh, Neve, maybe. But um, yep. yeah, so maybe some of the ones that are harder to, to spell <laughs> didn't quite yeah didn't quite get there like i've seen the spelling of your name like twice in my entire life mm -hmm. uh one person i actually uh worked at the same company as me but we never communicated it's just one of those ones i'd see emails yeah. sometimes and i'd always sit there and go how do you pronounce that yeah <laughs> you know the yeah. head cocked to the side like a dog <laughs> and there's worse than, than mine in the sense that like so i don't know if the name mave has made it over i think it probably has but i think it's probably spelt differently over here mave would be spelt like M A E D B H. There's a lot of like D B H's in Irish that are pronounced just V. So, oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah so, I've um, I've seen I've seen Mave here, but it's usually M A E V E. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's mm -hmm. kind of um that's an anglicization of it. We don't actually have a V in the in the language at all. So there's a lot of just <laughs> yeah. The only yeah, Mave so I know of is Queen Mave <laughs> from the boys and. She's oh, yeah. kind of messed up. I like her character, but man, she's a kind of messed up. Yeah. I hope she finds yeah. a way soon because. So you watch the boys. <laughs> I do. I'm looking forward to the. Is it the third season we're waiting for? for yes. That, is it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can't oh, yeah, wait. I really enjoyed that. That show, like that first episode, I was so blown away by it. I'm like, I am hooked. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm oh, absolutely. Totally hooked, me too. But I have to finish season two. I haven't finished all of it yet. Oh, okay. No spoilers, though. So. No spoilers. Oh, I don't mind. I don't Everybody mind dies. <laughs> oh, well, duh. Gee, that's like another one of my favorite shows that that happens on on the regular. They just don't stay dead on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Supernatural. Exactly. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about mm. what our subject will be tonight. Sure. Um, <laughs> so, I guess I'm hoping to, to kind of express myself <laughs> at, properly at, at two o'clock in the morning here so if I start to to lose uh sense you can just um you can just try and wake me up again um I guess I really wanted to contribute on my own experience with dealing with um a panic disorder and um and also at the time when I was diagnosed with panic disorders also diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder and depression and that was about 
six, seven years ago at this stage. So I, um, I, I've been taking a bit of a deep dive into my own mental health since then. And just doing a bit of work on myself to, um, to address some things I hadn't addressed to kind of work out some, some healthier coping strategies. And, um, and it's been a bit of a ride, but, um, but I'm at the side now where I'm, I'm quite comfortable, I suppose, talking about it, especially in a setting like this, where, you know, it's, it's very open and, and everybody's being real. So, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I suppose I will I give you a bit of a, a kind of a, a quick backstory or something with that um with that help yeah yeah I mean when right when we do the show the plat <laughs> the platform is yours we're just facilitating okay okay great great um yeah so I, I guess all of this kind of kicked off for me as I say in like 2013 2014 I um at the time I was living in in Boston and uh I had moved over about six months beforehand to, to work in, in Dana Farber, which is um, a hospital there. And uh, I, up until that point, I would say, I, I would have described myself as somebody who, you know, wasn't particularly anxious, wasn't particularly, you know, anything. I definitely had blips of, of kind of anxiety, blips of low mood. Um, and definitely I'm looking back now, the, the, the kind of the six months leading up to, you know, what, what I'm quite comfortable calling a, a nervous breakdown, I suppose, that, that I had over there. Um, in the six months preceding that, there was definitely stuff that, looking back, were, were kind of warning signs and were um, just maybe red flags uh, that, that something wasn't wasn't right or that something was kind of brewing a little bit for me. Um, I Basically, I kind of had, had started to have these these episodes of, of, I know now to be panic attacks, Um at the time, I, I didn't really totally get what was happening for, for a while. Um, I remember it, it all started for me kind of oddly. I, I thought it was odd at the time, but since then, I've, I've heard kind of similar stories from other people. Um, never had a panic attack in my life until I went to get my wisdom teeth taken out. And I don't know if this is the norm in the US, but in over here in Ireland, um, you can get that done with a local anesthetic. So you're, you're wide awake for it. You go in and you just kind of, you're almost just sitting in, in almost an office and, and the guy comes and kind of just hacks the teeth out. Uh, and then you're, you're walking away afterwards. You're, you're walking home. So I, you, the way, from your expression, I can tell that's maybe not totally how it, how it goes. They knock my are, ass get, out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have the option of that. It's just not, it's just not the, the, totally the norm be honest it's it's just cheaper and and like kind of less hassle to go in and get it done in in like the you know half an hour or something um and that's how they do like pretty much every other tooth but when it comes to the wisdom teeth because they're so far back sometimes they have to yeah. pry your jaw open just a little bit more and when you're asleep it's easier yeah. to do and then everybody yeah, wonders why yeah, exactly. they have tmj afterwards oh mm -hmm. yeah i had really bad tmj for for quite a few years and i still have horrible clicky jaw from it um every morning when and... i wake up i have to pop my jaw yeah, yeah. Oh, I drive people crazy when I'm eating. I don't even notice it anymore, but there's just a constant kind of a grinding. Um, uh, when, yeah, I, but... when I walk, my ankle constantly clicks, so I get that. But oh, mine yeah. is just like, you know, like popping your neck, popping your knuckles or your back. I have mm -hmm. to pop my jaw, too. Just one little pop. And then I'm like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, you kind of do the, I go like, the just, knocking it to one side. All I do is this. Just, it's just a certain yeah. method that I do, and it just goes, pop, I'm done. <laughs> pop. Yeah. A little satisfying, and you're like, okay, I'm getting yeah. on my day now. Meanwhile, anyone that knows that has never seen it before, they're like, ah, what'd you do? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's when you look at him and go, ah, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think people are like, how do you deal with that all the time? But your brain just kind of dials out noises that your own, you know, your own body is generating like that, I think, a lot of the time, just to kind of go, all right, that's the new normal now. We'll just, we'll just kind of, pretend that's not happening um but for me it was the it was the gender the anesthetic they were using um i got kind of five shots of it and and again the anesthetic here is probably different to the one over there it has a lot of um of what's basically adrenaline in it uh norepinephrine and um i could feel at the time when it when it happened i was kind of i remember saying to the guy uh, as he was doing it i was like oh you know i feel like i'm getting a bit of a buzz on like i, I kind of feel a little bit tipsy and he was like all right that that might not be normal um so yeah, maybe like, you know, wait a couple of minutes before, before we send you back out onto the street. This was like nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, um, 
And uh, and I, I remember I hadn't slept well the night before. I didn't have anything to eat just beforehand. Went out and uh, was kind of just walking home. And um, I remember just getting this sense of dread would be how I describe it. I was in the street and I felt like it, it was it was pretty accurately how they how they kind of depicted in films where where it's like the uh, the buildings seem to be sort of getting closer and further away. You get a sense of sort of vertigo. Um, and I felt like I was going to throw up. But I, the overwhelming feeling was like something is wrong. Something is 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 has gone wrong, and um, and I need to get inside. I felt very exposed. I was I was just out in the in the street, and I remember going back to the house and um, and I rang my mom and I said, you know, I've just had the the wisdom teeth extraction, but I think something went wrong because I really don't feel okay. I really feel like there's there's something there's something wrong. I just that was the way I kept phrasing it. It was really inarticulate at the time, but I was like, I think something's wrong. I think something is wrong. She was like, oh, you're probably just, you know, it's it's just the, the, the shock of kind of what happened is the anesthetic wearing off. Um, I'll come and get you. And she couldn't come and get me for like a couple of hours. But um, I started throwing up then for a good kind of, you know, half an hour. I was throwing, I, I was throwing up all the blood I swallowed. Sorry, this is quite gross. And um, and it was the the feeling that was with me because I, I, was, I was on my own completely in the house. And I um, the feeling was of, the sense of isolation that I had never really experienced quite before. It was a profound sense of, I am completely on my own. Something is very wrong with me and I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. So it was, it was this real mix of sort of physiological and just overwhelming sort of um, sense in my head that that's, you know, something bad is happening, something bad is happening. Um, and uh, that, it, at the time then, you know, I kind of, it, it passed and the next couple of days I felt a bit wobbly, but um, I actually went back and got the other teeth out a couple of weeks later and um, and didn't have quite the same experience. So I, I was like, OK, well, that must have just been a, some sort of thing with the anesthetic. But it did seem to open a sort of a door in my brain is how I would describe it, that this became something that my brain did now from time to time was kind of tip into this this level of just profound um, panic and uh, and anybody who's had kind of panic attacks probably experiences it slightly differently, but the sense of just, it was this, it's almost existential horror that goes with it um, was, was really overwhelming um, for me. And, and it started to happen kind of more frequently. And unfortunately it coincided with the time when I was in the process of moving over to, to the U S. So I was getting on airplanes a lot and I started to have the, the panic attacks to, to really come on strong um, on airplanes in the airport and in generally in kind of confined spaces and things like um, just situations where I felt like I couldn't easily leave the situation was 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 kind of the the main common thread, I suppose. So it, um, you know, I, I got over, I moved over and, and all of this. And I kept thinking this will all settle down when I'm when I'm over there and I start work and everything kind of gets um gets going. But um it actually just got it got much, much worse. And um in my job I was I remember, you know, I was sort of just trying to hold everything together. There was a sense for the first six months in the job I was trying to just hold everything together. So I was working in um, as I say, in, in a research role. Um in Dana Farber and uh, doing this, um, doing uh, research on, on um, brain tumors. Actually, it was, it was fascinating research, and we we worked with with patient samples, and we did a lot of, of stuff in the lab with um, you know with mice and with viruses and things like that. It was a really, it, it was kind of my my dream job. I, I did um, I, I did a PhD in biochemistry before I came over, and this was just where I wanted to be. Um, but See, now, I, I could found just it, have you talk about that for like days and I'd just be like this the whole time. We like, could do that another <laughs> time. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I, and I, I love talking about it. I love talking about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And anything that's like biological sciences or anything that has to do with like mm-hmm. nature as well. I'm just like, you know, the chin know. on my, yeah, chin on my fist, elbows on the ground. Go, Please keep talking. <laughs> I'm learning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh no, absolutely. I'm totally the same. Like I, I, and I love finding, I love kind of knowing the root cause of things. And, and that's why I went into biology and I did genetics before that is uh, before I did the, the PhD as well. Cause I just wanted to know, I wanted to get back to like the basics, like, but why does that happen? And why does that happen? And you keep coming back to like DNA is, is a lot of the time where of what I kind of come back to, but. Um, genetics and epigenetics. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Epigenetics, I think, is one of the most fascinating things out there. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. That's going to become much more, I mean, it already has become much more kind of a mainstream um, accepted that that that's plays such a big role in in what's going on for people, um, you know, on a on a mental health level as well, actually, I think. But yeah, when they say like, oh, anxiety can be mm-hmm. passed from family, you know, from per- you know, in the family, can be passed mm-hmm. from person to person. Well, that's a good example of epigenetics right there. <laughs> I agree, I agree, and I think that, I don't know if you've seen these studies they did with um, so in in Holland when there was uh, the famine, it would have been kind of about three generations ago at this point. There was pretty bad famine, and um, they had they looked at the um, we'll say like two generations on the the children of great grandchildren uh there was a a lot more schizophrenia in those in that kind of cohort of people than there would have been in the in the rest of the population and um they figured that it was something to do with the restriction of nutrients at that point changed the little epigenetic tags on on the dna for some genes that were really crucial for um for for developing schizophrenia yeah yeah i'm sure there's much more where that came from that they're still you know they're, they're doing more and more in that area so it's it's fascinating, yeah, and because it, it really throws a spanner in the works of like, you know, that idea of that you can't acquire things that are inherited during your life. It's just you get the DNA you get. Um, yeah, well, yeah, so some things should be triggered, and that flag can just go ahead and carry on. Uh, the best example I ever yeah. got is actually how yeah. I learned how it works. It was an experiment with rats, where they used the exact mm-hmm. chemical that cre- that is the scent of an orange. I can't remember the name of the chemical. It's a pretty long <laughs> name. But they would expose, uh, they had, it was like 100 uh, male rats and 100 female rats split into two groups of, you know, 50 males for control, 50 males for experiment, 50 control uh, female, 50 control experiment. And um, half of the, the males, half of the females got exposed to this chemical. And every time they got exposed, they received a mild electric shock until oh. the, they would get to the point where they get that, they got that, a whiff of that and they would freak out. And then what they did is they split those groups up again in half. So that way they would have, you know, a male. There's like 25 males with 25 females that have both been exposed breeding. 25 males with 25 females that hadn't been exposed breeding. And then, you know, all the way around. And it turned out that that gene, the, the, that, that flag, that marker, the epigenetic gene, or the, 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 the flag, it actually got passed on from the males that were exposed to all of their progeny. But only the males were able to pass it because it was attached to the Y chromosome. Yeah. So every... Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so like all of the rats in that, that, that clutch would freak out at the scent. But only the males of that clutch would pass it on to the next generation. And I was just like... That's really interesting. I was like, that's really interesting. But that you, sounds great. I was like, that's really interesting. But you just mm. literally screwed up mm. an entire... like chain of like for eternity lives of these rats they're going to smell it and freak out and not know why (laughs) yeah yeah absolutely yeah i don't know why my rats hate oranges so much kind of like (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know it's like you know it really sounds like if you could engineer that that would actually be quite useful it could be you know if we could figure out what those markers are it's like well hey you don't want anxiety anymore, right? Let's figure out how to stop it from expressing. Let's get rid oh, of that well, marker. That'd be great. Exactly. Yeah, I see, you got yeah. a big old grin off of I that one. <laughs> oh, that would be so great, though. Oh. Would be amazing. Uh, well, do you guys? Yeah. I mean, do you feel that there is a kind of a genetic component to your own mental health? Um, I don't know. What you, I, 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 I'm happy calling it mental health problems that I have from time to time, but to your own mental health, I suppose. Oh, my whole family's fucked up. I'm not even going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, in in my family, I wouldn't have I, I wouldn't have said that I thought there was a genetic thing until recently. Because my whole family is very they're very in the dark mental health wise. They it is very much a oh you go hide your crazy and you better act right because this isn't this is not how we do they are not open about mental health issues um so they're stuck that's, back that's, in the all the way back in the 1970s got it yeah pretty yeah. much 
mean, it's crazy yeah, to think that that's how far we've gone in just such a short time. Yeah. The, the, so, you know, I know that there are some issues out there that I, I see it in them, even though they don't want to admit it, just because I know I have it. You know, yeah. like I'm I'm diagnosed with um, depression and anxiety and um, PTSD. Mm-hmm. And I I recognize the anxiety and things in other people when even if they don't want to admit it's an anxiety. Yeah, I know what you mean. Mm-hmm. And do you think that's a labeling thing, Bexy? Like I was having this conversation with somebody recently. It's like, um, you know, some people are more comfortable calling anxiety something else. I, I, I guess it's like in Ireland, we have different sort of like phrases for this sort of stuff. You do, people be quite comfortable saying like, oh, my nerves are at me. You oh, know, or y- yes. Like, or sort of like it's, it's sort of a, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think. Nerves and, and know, kind of stress, I think. Yeah. Yes. Definitely that. And like, um, you know, like, in in you know the victorian era where people would be like oh i have the vapors oh no yeah. you're, you're anxious sweetheart <laughs> you have yeah. anxiety <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly no cuz i think that i think that really kind of plays a big role in it um for certain oh, definitely when it comes to accepting what's going on how about you Steve? definitely it looked like you had something to say I, I was gonna say um my side of the family has a lot of issues especially with addiction um i have no clue who, what my fa- father's mother was like apparently she did have a mental illness but we have no clue what it was because she abandoned him uh, my mom has a panic disorder my sister has anxiety and depression my other sister has an addiction and had depression. My brother is dealing with stuff like that. Um, so I could definitely say it probably is genetic, but I don't know much about uh, the specific disorders that I have. If they came from genetics, I think it did play yeah. a bit of a part, but I don't think it was all genetics. Um, that was at play. Yeah, I'd be inclined to think that there's I mean, it's kind of hard to subtract it a little bit to to, to take away the the environment component with with these things. Like I, I think, I think growing up, like so similar to you, see my I have a brother and sister. They both have suffered from uh, anxiety disorders. Uh, my sister also has had panic attacks in the past. My father also definitely has, I, I think, a uh, panic disorder and, and definitely anxiety disorder and probably depression as well. My mom also had panic attacks again this only kind of came to light when it started happening for me that you know my mom was like oh yeah I, I had that for a while as well and um whereas it was kind of more known that that my dad suffered with this um and I think there's you know there must be some sort of a, a kind of a predisposition I think um with some of these things like a sensitive more of a sensitivity to you know the adrenaline you're producing yourself or maybe something brain-wise in a, in a receptor that's soaking it up but um I also think that it's very hard to take away coming like growing up in an environment for me, I was growing up in an environment where, you know, I had a very happy childhood, but there was a very loving family, but there was a, there was messages that I got around how unsafe the world was, um, which I found doing kind of cognitive behavioral therapy years later were, were kind of hardwired into my brain. And I kind of, I remember, you know, working with a therapist to uncover some of this stuff and going, Oh, that's an odd one. You know, I have these kind of beliefs in my head that the world is not safe, that I have to, you know, be suspicious of people. I can't, I can't kind of trust people. And where did I get this stuff? And then it's trying to work out whose voice is that that's in my head. Cause I, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it's, it got in there somehow. And, and I, I suppose the general consensus is that it's a, it's a kind of a parent's voice from when you were very young, but um, yeah, I find, I find that fascinating just kind of being able to, unpack some of that that messaging that's that's going on that can be kind of subconscious um uh, once you're an adult um yeah sorry I, mean, I took it on a tangent there no it's cool but it's like you know the <laughs> it's just yeah the world is unsafe but you can't wrap yourself in you know bubble wrap you know yeah yeah 
you got to be able to take you have to be able to take risks you have to learn how to mitigate them and manage them exactly and it's not easy you know and i look at my older kids i'm like yeah sorry i give you guys my anxiety and i'm looking at my younger kids going i really hope you don't get my anxiety (laughs) yeah yeah that's an interesting one yeah because i don't have any kids yet but i i think about that a lot as you know how do i kind of protect them from from my stuff how do i stop the the kind of the legacy of things like this um so i'd be really curious to hear what you you know what you you i take a more of a hey let them figure it out you know it's like what you know what they they might get injured we might have to go to the er but they're not going to kill themselves they're not going to seriously injure themselves you know maybe Mm -hmm. a stitch here a stitch there you know and even then i get a little bit nervous but if it's like oh they're just going to get a bruise all right, let them figure it out. <laughs> They'll figure it out. Yeah. But yeah. when I was younger, I was yeah. like, no, don't do that. No, don't do that <laughs> with my kids. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. And uh, my wife is the one that's it's like, just... no, they can't do that. I'm like, really? Because they're doing it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like my, my daughter, she just turned six. We can't get her out of door jams. She climbs to the top of them and she'll just sit there, arms out, legs straight down. And she'll just sit there and like, she has so much core strength. That she can actually lift her legs up to touch the top of the door jam. She is incredibly strong. And I was like, I used to climb door jams, so I really can't be a hypocrite about this. So I was like, "Uh, honey, (laughs) just don't climb the door jams when your brother's around because I don't want you falling and hurting him and I don't want him pulling you down. You know, but that's my wife's like, really, you're going to allow that? I'm like, come on, you climb door jams, right? Well, yeah, okay. Then why can't she? (laughs) Yeah, that's that's a. I think that's a good. That's a healthy kind of perspective on it as well. It's it's that kind of sense of just kids will will learn, and they are they have a sense of sort of invulnerability at that age that you you kind of want them to lean into a little bit, but while also having excuse me a healthy respect for their own safety, but a healthy respect for it rather than you know a a paranoia, I suppose, or Um, actually think that they're indestructible. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. both sides are really bad. Um, yeah, it's it's getting that balance in the middle. That's that's what I it seems like a mystery to me when, when I think about being a parent. It's just how do you uh, manage that? I don't know. Yeah, it's like uh, with my wife and I, a lot of our gender roles are fl- are flipped. She's the breadwinner. I'm working, you know, and I love my job. I don't need to work. But I love my job. I love it. It is so much fun. Um, not going to lie. If this podcasting stuff turned out to become my new income, I quit my job. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is way better. <laughs> this is way better. But um, no, you know, and there's a lot of other things like that. But when it comes to the parenting part, she's the mothering, nurturing, mother hen, always, you know, helicopter mom. And I'm just like, let him off the leash. Let him run. Let him be wild and be yeah. free. Let them yeah, play in the range. dirt. Yeah. yeah. Although I'm, yeah. my son, he decided to try to lick the car today. I was like, "Yeah, no, you're going to get sick doing that." <laughs> oh, yeah, door jams is one thing, but getting under the car is yeah, no, is a different yeah. story. Licking and things it, is gross. <laughs> yeah, I just yeah. all I can think of is Futurama when Leela had a, had a children's show, and there was this song: <laughs> "If it's alive, don't lick it." <laughs> Yeah, and then what happens once you get older and you get sexually active? (laughs) (laughs) Just saying. Contradictory uh, statements there, but still. I'm sorry. That was just such a that was a softball right down the middle. I had to. I know. Well, there's a part in the song that says, if you're not sure if it's alive or dead, poke it with a stick and lick the stick instead. Uh, <laughs> that is still really bad advice. <laughs> I know. Cursed advice. <laughs> Meanwhile, Deverne in the chat just said, lick everything. <laughs> yeah, it's in doubt. <laughs> oh, God, Deverne. Yeah, also Deverne was talking about, you know, when you're talking about panic attacks. He said, for me, panic attack is where the heart is racing and me thinking, oh, I'm dying. And then I responded back. 100%. I went back. This isn't a heart attack. This isn't a heart attack. This might be a heart attack. Oh, God, I'm dying. Because that's how it yeah. happens with me. Yeah. See? Yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. She's trying to get the words out. 
<laughs> I was gonna say, um, my mother, she described hers, and like you said, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember your name, I'm so sorry. Sorry, I'm actually, I might put in the, Aoife, exactly, yeah, Aoife, I'll put in okay. the phonetics into the um, little thing here. I learned uh, my mom had a panic disorder because of my own issues, and she described it to me as feeling as if she was going to die, like someone was out there going to kill her. And I actually had the same exact experience like that, like her. Um, so, yes, <laughs> I, yes, it's, that's that's what it's like for her. I'm sorry. Yeah, and it's like uh, yeah. with a yeah. panic attack, a lot of times, because you're going to start breathing more rapidly, you start to uh, hyperventilate, which will cause tightness yeah. in your chest, which will make you think, mm-hmm. oh, God, heart attack, which only spirals it out of control. <laughs> But the beauty is the that one? most people, most panic attacks only last about five minutes. Feels like an eternity, yeah. but they only last yeah. about yeah. five minutes. Whereas a heart attack, if you're actually having a heart attack, wait five minutes. If you're dead, you had a heart attack. So, no, actually, yeah. if you really yeah. think you're having a heart attack, call 911. Seriously. Let, let, don't don't yeah. even play with it. Even if it's just a panic yeah. attack, you will learn the difference. It takes time, but oh, you absolutely. will learn the difference. Because then after that, you stop saying, this isn't a, pan- a heart attack. You're like... Nope, I'm not having a panic attack. Nope, I'm not having one. Nope, not going to acknowledge it. Because if I acknowledge it, oh crap, I just acknowledged it. Oh god, here it comes! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that I was going to so say, am, am, I, am, am I alone in having auditory hallucinations when I have a panic attack? That's not something I've, I've experienced, but I have heard other people talk about a high-pitched noise, maybe, um, that comes on with it. Sometimes it's a noise. Sometimes it sounds like I can only equate it to um, like somebody starting a group of motorcycles. Um, and some sometimes it's actually words. I mean, it, it, it varies, but it's yeah. I, I get some auditory issues when I have a panic attack too. I I, I can go for it. See, I can say. Uh... I have never had auditory hallucinations in a panic attack, but I have had auditory hallucinations. Oh, yeah. We've talked about <laughs> yeah. that. We've, we've yep. talked about that. I you, remember. Yeah. About three hours yeah. worth on that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Aoife, so C was the first person and still only person to hit the full three-hour mark on our podcast. Because we have a sure, three-hour really hard fun. limit. And we're like, yeah, we, okay. we've never gone that far. It's usually an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours. Three hours later, it's like, okay, we have to stop now <laughs> because we're about to get cut off. Uh, That's it, it great. Just, I, must, I must go back and re-listen to that one. Yeah, it was that good an episode. It really was. Yeah. But for me, it's like I don't get the auditory hallucinations when I'm having a panic attack. Um, I get the mm-hmm. feeling like my head's trapped in a – you know those Corona aluminum buckets for the Corona beer? It feels uh-huh. like I have one of those over my head. Same thing happens when I'm having a uh, manic episode and I'm angry. Yeah. Or if I'm in an argument, I start feeling really exhausted suddenly, and I get that same feel like there's that bucket over my head. I wonder what that's about. Is it like a feeling of being, it sounds sort of suffocating. Yeah, yeah I feel like I'm suffocating, um, which was really great because I have claustrophobia. So <laughs> that's always uh. fun. Um <laughs> But it also, it's like everything that I'm saying is really magnified and my ears are ringing and it's hard for me to hear what others are saying because it's so, like, over-pronounced. Yeah. It's like yeah. my ears become too sensitive. For me, it was... Exactly. Yeah, I know what you mean because I kind of... So I don't have that so much with my hearing, but I, I've i had um, sort of visual... I, I had, I'm having a lot of visual sort of neurological problems early on that must have been along the same lines. I, I think... I used to literally, it was that thing where it, it seems like the everything is getting closer and further away at the same time and giving you that kind of sense of vertigo. Um, you mean like the Hitchcock zoom? And I think it was zoom? that my eyes used to dilate. Exactly, exactly. It's very accurate, um, I find. And, that, uh, that effect is one of my favorite effects. Really, really kind of nauseous. So I was going to say, that's one yeah. of my favorite effects, but every time I see it, I'm like, oh, God, I hate that feeling, but I love seeing that. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I think it's one of those really accurate portrayals where you're like, "That's it, they've they've nailed that." That's and it's really accurate. One of the hardest yeah. things in all of cinema to do is that Hitchcock zoom, because you have to be mm-hmm. on a like a, a pulley system. Everything has to be timed 
perfectly. In case you guys don't know what the Hitchcock zoom is, it's when the background seems to fall away and the protagonist or the uh, person of focus or whatever comes zooming up towards the camera. That's the Hitchcock yeah. zoom. Yeah. And it is, I mean, when it's done, it is breathtakingly done. Like, uh, one of the most exactly. profound times I've ever seen it was the beginning of uh, Ever After, a Cinderella story. You know, with Drew Barrymore, but back when she was the, the <laughs> little girl and her dad fell off their horse having a heart attack. That Hitchcock zoom was one of the most powerful ones I've ever seen. Because yeah. it's like yeah. it was oh, like the reality of it just hit home is what it looked is what it felt like. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a sense of, and I, I gather like, and again for me maybe it's just my experience of this, but I, I found that learning more about what was going on for me physiologically when panic attacks are happening sort of took a lot, took a sort of the, the extra level of fear that came with them dropped down a little bit because when it first started happening and I didn't know what was going on there was this the immediate sort of sense of dread and then there was the kind of noticing what's going on and going oh there's something wrong with my heart there's something wrong with my vision there's something wrong with my breathing and all of this kind of piling on um but when I realized when it when I kind of read more about what was happening in my brain and what was happening in my body when when that's happening then I was able to just take that down a notch and go all right this is because you know I'm getting a rush of blood to my ears and my eyes at the moment because my body's in fight or flight. It's trying to take in as much information as possible from the situation so that it can act. Um, I, I remember like I used to find myself in airport bathrooms a lot, just having a panic attack and my eyes would be dilated. Like I had taken something like just popping. Um, and that went with that sort of trippy, as you say, that the Hitchcock zoom feeling, um, but that, that lasted from, for months kind of, of just, I'd be in, an, in a very open space, and I would have that where I'd have to just just go inside. And then again, as you say, I had kind of a claustrophobia at times too. So it, it was kind of hard to find a, a sort of a space that was <laughs> that was comfortable at times. But um, yeah, it's 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 a weird one. Um, the other thing I found early on, again, it was I think it was that first day with the with the adrenaline shots. Um, I would get a lot of stuff with my heart um, rhythms going out of whack, and that was the other thing that just used to really really disturb me um about the panic attacks and about the anxiety in general is that the um that sensation of just there being something wrong with with my heart as you're saying that kind of feeling of like oh i'm having a heart attack and it just reinforces that because then that that there's another kick of adrenaline coming off of that that realization um and then it just makes the heart pattern i remember going to like exactly exactly yeah yeah i used to get these kind of it would would feel like again it's 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 the thing where people talk about my heart skipped a beat but in a really unpleasant sort of way. And it's very, it's very um, sort of unnerving to have something that's, that's so sort of um, I mean, fundamental a, to your well-being go, go awry like that. Yeah. Um, Arrhythmia is scary. That, that's what it is. It really is. It, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. it's, and that's a very, um, very, what they would call, I think is the term is a negative feedback loop. Cause that's what it is. Exactly. It's just, Oh my God, my heart's going crazy. I'm going to die. You get the yeah. adrenaline and yeah. it causes the heart to go crazier. Oh my God, I'm really dying. More adrenaline. Heart goes That's even a- crazier. <laughs> Just, ah. Yeah. yeah. It's a Completely. vicious cycle. Completely. And eventually, because of the yeah, panic absolutely. attack, your body's like, okay, I'm exhausted. I'm done with this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, mm. That was the other thing. And then your brain's like, wait, I'm not dying? Why didn't you stop this sooner, body? And the body's like, you started it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. I kinda, again, I remember reading this early on that it's like adrenaline, the half-life of adrenaline in your body is so short. As you say, it's kind of like five to ten minutes. It peaks and then it troughs. Mm-hmm. But once I once I kind of get into it with my brain and start catastrophizing what's going on and start kind of, uh, again, piling on and noticing other things and, you know, thinking the worst, um, then that that constantly is just kicking off more and more adrenaline. So you never really reach that sense of just, Oh right, I'm coming down the other side. There's there's always like another kind of, um, you know, another rise kind of coming after that. I remember, I, I pinpointing like when when things got really bad for me, um, in in Boston. It was one particular weekend. I remember I was I had been working in the in the lab the day before. It felt sort of fluey was kind of how I was describing it, and um, I had been working with uh, a virus that we were using in in all the kind of the biosafety. Um, you know, the, these kind of uh, cabinets that you see in films and things, you have your hands through and with the little gloves and you're, you're kind of poking around with the, with the, 
the beakers and stuff and uh almost like you're sandblasting something to... <laughs> yeah 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 um we, we used to use these viruses to kind of um to add a, a different gene or to, to block a gene in, in a particular type of type of cell that we were using. So the, and these viruses would be kind of, you know, low key stuff. They, they wouldn't be anything too catastrophic, but um, this one was, was just one of the, the slightly lever, higher level ones. And um, I remember it at one point I finished everything that I was doing and I looked down and I had a hole in my glove and, um, and I just had this sense of like, Oh no. And, um, you know, I went away and I, I sprayed all the ethanol and did everything that I was supposed to do in that situation. But I remember just feeling really uneasy when I when I went home and later that night, it kind of wouldn't wouldn't leave my head. My head wouldn't leave it alone. And um, and I was already feeling that kind of fluey thing. So it was very easy for me to join up on my head. All oh, right. I've, I've been exposed to something. I've probably, you know, gotten some sort of something's been absorbed through my skin. And I remember spitting out that night and um, and, and make, working myself up to the point where I remember just throwing up. All night, all night from just the the anxiety of what I was telling myself, and I remember a couple of days later, then being back in the lab, and um, this sense of of the dread just came over me. I was just sitting at the desk, and the sense of dread came over me, and um, and I remember I just I I ran down the stairs, ran out home. I mean, I grabbed myself, ran out, got onto the the, the underground, and um, and went home. And I I never went back after that day. I just it kickstarted a, a kind of a weekend for me at that stage where I, I remember going home, going up to my room, sitting down in the corner in like the, the kind of the smallest space that I could find. And I started to have panic attack after panic attack for that, that night and the following day. I think I, it, it was that thing again of just as soon as there was a drop in, in the adrenaline, it started again. I think I had probably had about 10 or 11 in a row of those kind of peaks and troughs. Um, and I went to the, the emergency room because I didn't really I I kind of had a sense at that stage that this was panic attacks but I also was just spinning out completely and um you know and then they kind of confirmed that they they did the usual checks and everything to make sure as you say you're not having a heart attack reassure you um sent me home with with a load of of the Ativan and and then you know made it made an appointment for me to go to the the psychiatric hospital um the, in a couple of days time so it was yeah it was this kind of um very physiological sort of snapping point I think really where I just I remember thinking you know even if I mentally could could keep getting up and going to work and get into the train my body was just like nope no 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 we're not we're not kind of we're not doing this anymore I couldn't get into the you know, going to the supermarket became really hard because I would get that that kind of claustrophobia sense. I would get the feeling of being overwhelmed. It was too bright. It was too noisy. Everything was too much stimulation. I'd have to just leave after a couple of minutes. And um, being in the street was too much. Being in the, the underground in the subway was out of the question. And um, and then it, it kind of just <laughs> went on from there. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. if, you hear, think... if you hear Bexy crying at any point, it's normal. <laughs> just okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not. Don't yeah. take. Don't get offended by it. Don't like worry too much. She's very empathetic. So, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's um, yeah. I, thank you for for pointing that out because I wouldn't want to think that I was upsetting anybody by recounting it. I suppose. Um, no, and she... I know everybody's experience of these things is is different. Yeah. And it also kind of goes to show how when you're having panic attacks, all rational thought goes out the window. Oh, yeah. It's like, number Absolutely. one, you're plagued with viruses, so you understand incubation periods. Yeah. But you had a yeah. hole in your glove, and you freaked out about being exposed and being sick by a virus that hadn't had time to incubate. And yeah. let me guess, it was actually pretty mild. If you had gotten exposed and you had gotten infected by it, not much would have happened, yeah. I'm guessing. Absolutely. The virus I was using was kind of, it was an adenovirus. So, you know, it's kind of like the same type of virus family that causes the cold. Um, so, you know, worst case scenario might have felt unwell for a while, but there was there was just at the time I wasn't able to manage my own kind of thoughts in the way that I might be able to now. Um, and that I that I kind of had to work a lot on on doing was my head would just spin out with these things and there was no there was raining it in it was was just impossible at times. Um, I really had to do a lot of work on that on that uh, that side of things, just bringing logic back into it. And again, it was like 
reading about what's ha- what's going on when when you're having really kind of extreme anxiety that there's a lot of your your brain is operating a lot like kind of in, in the hind brain the, the lizard part of your brain and the old part uh at, at the, the fight or flight level but when you can if you can engage your the front part of your brain and the, and the you know the frontal lobes the kind of the, the human part again and bring logic into it you can interrupt that that cycle a little bit certainly that's that's one of my go-to things now anyway, is to just try and go, okay, this is, this is happening. It's a normal physiological reaction to, you know, whatever the situation is. And um, it's maybe gotten slightly out of hand, um, but I can still talk to myself about it. I can still kind of, you know, be curious about it and, um, and just do a little bit of questioning around, you know, is this, do I have much evidence to support what I'm telling myself? Have I experienced this before? Is, is it familiar in any way? And, and maybe did I not die last time? And uh, and stuff like that, just kind of questioning. And then, and then the extreme of that, I suppose, would be for me to be to check that with somebody else and go, okay, so I'm I'm noticing that I'm having these these thoughts at the moment. It's making me feel anxious, making me feel panicked. Um, you know, can I just check a couple of things with you? You know, I, I'm feeling really unsafe at the moment. Things like that. So I had to do a lot of that early on, and and it kind of. I relied a lot on other people, I think, to to reassure me um, because it was it was so new. But getting better as it now. went on, I was, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. But a huge part of that was was um, you know I I started to kind of almost obsessively write down my symptoms around things, and you know be like, oh, I had I had this many, you know, my 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 heart rhythm was doing this today, or I, I felt like this when I was here, and then another day, if I if I started to feel like that again, I'd flick back through the the the, the diary and I go. Oh right, I actually felt like this like two weeks ago, and I was fine afterwards. So I I could kind of kind of come down a little bit, and that's I think that's kind of the scientist in me helping me out a little bit because I I would see it as sort of like data, and go oh, okay, well you know the from from previous experience this this doesn't seem to to land you in hospital or or cause anything, you know there's there's nothing bad happening here. So it was it was really reassuring for me to just unfortunately go through some some unpleasant experiences but be able to to relate back to it the next time and go well that wasn't that wasn't quite as bad as I thought and and that wasn't what I was telling myself at the time didn't pan out there so so that was really helpful um but yeah it's it bringing logic into it is and it's very difficult when you're in the in the middle of, of, of anything like that it's it's very very difficult to yeah. engage that from part of your brain because at that point chicken little has taken over Exactly. And the sky is falling. Yep. And it's like, you know, for mm. me, I could do that whole thing of, I didn't die before, and then all of a sudden the little voice in the back of my head goes, survivor's bias! I'm like, oh, come yeah. on! Yeah. <laughs> Just oh, come no. on! <laughs> yeah. That little yeah. voice back there. I hate that, that little before. voice. before, it's not this time. Exactly. Yes. Every time. Yes. And it's like, and you've been wrong every <laughs> time. And it's like, well, what yeah. if I'm right once? Well, what if I'm right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. That's so familiar, actually. <laughs> it, right? it, it's like the more educated you are, I've noticed, the more you fall into those pitfalls. Like, you know about logical fallacies. So guess what? You're always going to question yourself and that stuff. You're going to be like, absolutely. Am I prophesizing? Am I doing fortune telling? Yeah. Am I, you know, what's, yeah. what's my cognitive distortion that I'm suffering with this time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Black and white thinking. Yeah, I remember just ticking those off at one point as well and just being like, wow, this is significant amount yep. of, of distortion here. Yep. Minimizing, maximizing is one of my worst. Yeah. Like, I could be getting crushed under a boulder. I'm okay. You have that big old boulder on you. It's a pebble. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I, I kind of... I'm just thinking back now to that time again and, and it's it's odd because I feel like in a way my brain has changed quite a lot since then yet when I'm recounting it I can still kind of inhabit it a little bit um, and what I I suppose what I'm left with is and what really struck me again I don't know if this is just my own experience of, of panic attacks is there's a profound sense of loneliness with it for me um, and a sense of just being very alone in a way that's like you know like alone in my body in the sense that nobody else somebody else could be standing right next to me talking to me everything but they don't they aren't in here with me experiencing what I'm experiencing and 
and they never will be able to. So I'm I'm kind of trapped at a very kind of basic level. And maybe that that that's maybe I'm not explaining that correctly, but it's like that that sense of just yeah isolation, I suppose, is is a big one that comes with me for for panic attacks. Um, and even nowadays, when I kind of and, and these days, I would get you know panic attacks for me are, are sort of they've become something that pretty much only occur again around airplanes and airports i don't seem to be able to to shake it when it comes to those to it comes to that that situation um i've i've been able to sort of manage it in in other situations but with that it's just it's become um it's become always i always have had the adivan with me if i'm taking a flight um and there was a long period of time where i wouldn't take any flights but i started to again it, but it, it for some reason that's just the one that that i can't quite get over and I say this to my doctor every time I go into her and say, I have a, another flight coming up. You know, I wish I didn't have to do this, but I do need something for it. Um, and and again, just kind of being a bit gentle on myself for just kind of going, OK, well, you know, it could be worse. You're, you're, you're using this to to get through a flight. It, it's been a lot worse in the past. But um, it's uh, when I think about how disrupted my, my life has been because of this, that's currently that's that's kind of that's okay for me to just have to deal with it in, in that, that situation. Um, and then there's things like if I'm having the, another kind of trigger for me, I suppose that um, in, in since, since I've sort of begun to, to manage it a bit better, it's been, um, it's been if I'm having a, if there's a, a kind of an argument going on around me or if I'm having an argument with somebody for some reason that also can kind of kind of trigger um, a bit. Again, it's, it's the fight or flight, I think. And for me, it's, it's, um, it's flight <laughs> rather than fight. So I'm, I'm not a very confrontational person. I'm pretty kind of, um, I'm a bit of a people pleaser. <laughs> I see C nodding a, a lot there to that. Almost yeah. head banging to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the music of the, the passive. Yeah, yes. exactly. It's um, but music also of understanding. Reason, it's just, yes. Yeah. And it's yeah. not even just fight or flight. Uh, there's also faint and uh, deer in headlights. too. <laughs> yeah. Freeze. Yeah. Or freeze. freeze. Yeah. I like, I like fight or flight and deer in headlight. That way it, it kind of rhymes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. I tend to it's, deer in headlights. Um, yeah. What is that kind of, that's one that I kind of, I try to wrap my brain around sometimes because for me, it's all about escape. It's all about get out of the situation. So I don't know what quite that feels like when you're feeling total. Is it like a kind down. of a. Yeah. Like I'm screaming at myself yeah. to do something. And I can't. You can't move. I can't. I just sit there, and it, yeah. and a lot yeah. of times it pisses whoever's <laughs> it pisses them off even more, and it just makes it worse. Yeah, <laughs> they're like, I need you yeah. to say something. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just oh, it's it's awful. What's going on in your in your head? Do you know when that's when that's happening? Is it kind of is is, is the thought process shut down as well? I, mean, I guess I mean, momentarily it'll shut down. And then it's me mm. telling myself, okay, you can do this. Respond. Say something. Do something. Yeah. Hit them. Run. Something. And the body's just like, nah, mm. I'm yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. It's like you com- well, become completely detached from your body. It is weird. Yeah. And sometimes it's almost yeah. like you're living in your own head third person. It's weird. Yeah. Is that dissociation? Is that what they, they... I don't know if it's disassociation. Is that a type of dissociation? Because I'm still fully aware of what's I kind happening. Of began, I, yeah, yeah. I read descriptions of dissociation being it kind of with regards to anxiety. And I, I think I've had a bit of that in the past as well myself. But it's it's so hard to sort of put a, put a kind of... Um, put a clear experience to it. I, I've had things where I feel like I'm, I'm sitting there, um, but my hands and feet are, are swelling up more and more and more and more and more. And if I have my eyes closed, it's even worse. It's like, I'm afraid that my, it's like my body is, is swelling or something. And I can't, I can't control it. It's a really weird kind of perceptual thing. It must be again, something to do with circulation, but it, it, it and it's like, I'm, I'm not quite there. I'm sort of watching it happen. It's again, it's just one of those weird neurological sort of ticks that comes along with um with the, with a rush of of stress hormones, I think. But um, yeah, I see C nodding again. <laughs> I love that. I, um, I have had the emphaticness situations. of your responses are like yes. 
I, I have had situations where I don't really know if it's dissociation, but it's definitely a, what they call derealization, where everything around yeah. me or people around me, even if I touch it, still feels fake. A hundred percent does not feel real. Uh, the longest time that ever happened was for three days. And all three of those days, I was a crying mess. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine feeling like mm. you're the only thing real in the yeah. world for three days. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah. No, that's... Wow, that sounds heavy. I, I've i never had that kind of level of it. That sounds really overwhelming, actually. It is quite isolating, yeah. especially when you're like... Uh, yeah. When you're touching something like wood, and you're like, okay, it feels real, mm. but this isn't real. <laughs> it's your mind... Tricking yeah. you, kind of, in a way. It was very isolating feeling. Yeah. I can see it now. Look left. Yeah. Look right. Take a sip. This is the Matrix. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, this is a simulation. What the hell is happening mm-hmm. right here? And actually, <laughs> Devern, Bexy's slipping on the chat here a little bit, but Devern. Uh, it's not <laughs> popping up for me. Sorry. Oh, that's why. Okay. Sometimes uh, it but, happens to yeah, me, too. Devern yeah. says. This is one of the most calming, serious, fun shows you've had. This episode is like a healthy, balanced diet. There was actually something before that. And, oh, he says, yeah, do certain sounds. Sorry if she said this already caused panic for you. For me, certain sounds. That's interesting. Oh, I think probably early on when, when it was all kicking off for me, I found it difficult to be in very noisy places. So again, things like the supermarket or things like um, like a bar, uh, a pub were, was hard. Um, even being on the street, a lot of like, if there was a lot of sort of ambient noise, like a lot of traffic noise, a lot of people, it was like um, my brain dialed up a little bit like you were, you were describing earlier, like my brain dialed up the volume on all of that and it became sort of overwhelming um in in the sense that what my brain would normally go oh that's just background noise that, that's fine it just became oh pay attention to all of this because some of it might be important to your safety right now so yeah definitely i, I remember um when i came back to ireland <laughs> i remember when i came back to ireland um going out to to pubs which is what what we do here um was really really difficult for for a while just that sense of just it was so noisy that I it almost went felt physically like um like I was kind of suffocating in a little little bit was the best way I can describe it um so I really had trouble like that and but again I, I kind of I suppose it was just I had to reassure myself to a certain extent that this is because you know my my senses are a bit heightened at the moment that's that's what's going on um, but it's very, it's very overwhelming. And, and it was almost, you know, I, I kind of, like I, my parents um, live very rurally in, in the middle of nowhere um, out here. And uh, when I moved back to, to Ireland after, after everything kind of fell apart in, in Boston, I went to live with them. And it was, it was the difference between being in a big city like Boston, which just, again, me coming from small town in Ireland felt enormous and huge and overwhelming. Um, anyway never mind with with anxiety um when i moved back to ireland i moved back to just the middle of nowhere and the the quietness was just i found really soothing um i didn't realize how much that that was kind of helping me it was it was just the the kind of the lack of anything that my brain felt i had to pay attention to you know that that lack of stimulation was was good i did, like i needed to just be in a sort of a, a sensory deprivation situation for a while um so yeah i think that's um we actually I think have, for me, have sensory deprivation pools here in my area yeah. where they put you on a have pod. Have you ever tried it? No, I have yeah. to. I've, I've, I've told it's an amazing said, thing. It's been like the claustrophobic you you, in me. You, yeah, Claustrophobia. I was just going to say, I, I think I, I could struggle with that myself. Yeah, I don't know. But like for me, there's this, there's this little place. It's a little, it's too small to be a mountain, but it's too tall to really be a hill. It's called Black Butte. Um, the trailhead's at about 3,700 feet up, I'd say, and it goes to over 6,000 feet. It takes, you know, if you're in good shape and you're used to the elevation, you can hike it in an hour. Um, me in the shape I'm in now and living at low elevation, it'd take me about four to five hours 
But there's one part. There's a bend where... Because like most of the time you're facing one town and there's a freeway there and railroads. But then it wraps around to one spot. And it's just you, forests, and Mount Shasta. That's it. No roads, no freeway, no noises. It is so quiet that you can hear the slightest breeze. You can hear, like, if you have any kind of uh, tinnitus at all, you will hear the ringing in your ears. It is so quiet. You can hear your own blood rushing through your ears. It, It is... And it, but you're like it's your wide o- you know, eyes are wide open. It's beautiful. You can see the clouds. You see birds flying around below you and above you. Absolutely amazing. So I can only imagine that was kind of what it was like going because it's just like everything yeah. just melts away. Exactly, exactly. It just and it takes just a little bit of the pressure off your body if it's feeling overstimulated and it feels like it has so many different jobs to do in one particular mm-hmm. moment, and that's part of what you're finding overwhelming taking that that out of the picture um it was the same just be kind of having to close my eyes sometimes if I was if I was somewhere that was again very busy like I made what was have been like one of the worst mistakes of my life of in you know the midst of the panic attacks happening during the months that it was kind of bad uh in the states which was you know kind of February to I think I left in June I and so we went for to um Southie in Boston for St. Patrick's Day for some reason and um i remember being there and about 10 seconds in i was like this was a huge mistake what am i doing it was like being in it was we have the parades in ireland for the st patrick's day parades and it's and it's noisy and overwhelming this was like amped up and with the level of sort of i like I, I kind of feel safe in in that situation in ireland up, and, up until then anyway but in the us i, I kind of just everything was spinning around my head of just oh my god this is this is like being on a film set and, and something could happen and it's just I, I was just spinning out um so it was yeah being in crowds and and kind of I remember just having to close my eyes to do walk through to walk out because of the that kind of sense of just being um again bombarded with with things to take in and with people and noise and and all of that it's just again it kind of it's very typical to what you see when it's done right in, in films, I feel like um, that sense of just everything is, is kind of um, everything is, is up very close as far away, but the noise is rushing in and it's just, yeah, that sense of, of overstimulation, I think. Um, yeah. It's uh, I when I came back to, to Ireland. He does that effect really well. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. What I was thinking of as well. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, when I came back to Ireland, I, I kind of, there was a period of time. So, and, and, and kind of just to, I suppose, to um, put some perspective on how I look at it now, like what happened in the US it, at, at the time, it, it sort of, it, it also derailed my career completely. Um, I had, as I said, I'd gone to college in, in Ireland, I did an undergrad, I did my PhD, and then this job was like, you know, it was just like, um, it was it was everything I had wanted, and it was it was kind of the place to be if you wanted to do cancer research, which I which I've been doing for the previous kind of eight years. So it was just it was so um, devastating to have to leave that. I, I did have to quit that job, that, that research position when I was over there um, after the panic attacks got so bad that I couldn't leave the house. Um, and I remember saying to ex- trying to explain to my boss what was going on, and um, he was a um, so he's a clinician, but he works specifically on brain tumors. And I remember him saying to me, you know, that sounds, that sounds like maybe you should have a CAT scan. Um, oh, what you're describing. Great. And I, <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's uh, helpful. That hadn't occurred to me. Brain tumor. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Great. So I really okay. am dying, but it's not my heart. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like, oh, it hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me. But now it's going to occur to me constantly. Um, yep. Now I'm going to have so to go ahead was, and have one every six unhelpful. months. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, mm. exactly. If I could get a portable one, that'd be that'd be perfect. Thanks. Um, yeah, and and he was very understanding, and and kind of you know the the group I was working with were very understanding. I was I was in charge of several projects at the time, and you know there were students there, there was technicians that I was in charge of, and I I just I literally just left one day and didn't come back, and they they were very um, considerate about it, but I 
for for ever, for years afterwards, I felt this enormous sense of guilt about, um, I suppose, leaving them in in the lurch uh, like that. And um, and it's it's it also it, it meant that I when I got back to Ireland, I I still I'd been out of work for the kind of the previous six months when I was in the US. When I got back to Ireland, I there was another kind of I'd say year where I couldn't really function enough to to work to, to kind of hold down a job and um I had moved back in with my parents I was about 29 at that point and it just felt like the end of the world to me because this was I'd lost my career I had lost this this whole kind of life that I had um that in my head I had built up to be you know this is everything you want and um moving back in with your parents yeah and having no job and having no money because you know, I spent I, all of my savings had had gone once I had stopped working in, in the US trying to trying to pay rent and things. Um, it was really, it was a really really low point, and um, I started to kind of. I remember it was uh, trying to just get reassurance from people that this wasn't the end of the world was was a big part of of what I did, but it was you know seeking out kind of other people who had had sort of similar experiences. I remember kind of getting in touch with with friends and things that I remembered in the past had mentioned something about, you know, ha- having anxiety or having panic attacks or having depression and going, Oh, actually, could we, I remember you said this like 10 years ago, could we come back to that now <laughs> that it concerns me? And just, but well, people were very good as well. It was like, I was able to reconnect with, with some, with some friends when I get back and, and just sort of get to know them in, in a different way. It almost felt like I remember, um, you know, just there was a sense of just having to be real with people um, that I hadn't maybe maybe totally had before. I had to be very um, open about what had happened as well. That was that was the other part of it. I there was I came back with a lot of shame um, because of what had what had gone on because of this you know nervous breakdown that I had had. Um, for me, it, it was it was there was a lot of um, feeling like I let people down. I let down you know my family, all of the the people that had mentored me when I was in college and, um, and they kind of thought that I was going to have this, this career. And uh, it took, that took a surprisingly long time to be okay with explaining to people what had actually happened. I came back and I alternated a little bit between saying, you know, if I met somebody in the street, for example, that I used to work with in, in the university in Ireland, be like oh you know how can you how can you left that job and I'd be like oh you know it just wasn't really for me I just realized that research wasn't really what I wanted to do and every time I said that it felt so inauthentic and dishonest that it just ate away at me um that say, sense of having to lie about it I was gonna say, know, it probably it was, felt like you were stabbing yourself yeah yeah it was very exactly it was it was very um yeah it was doing something to me and my own sense of of kind of self worth that I that I think was was problematic. Um, it's only really in the last kind of year or so that I've been able to be honest with the people that I worked with, you know, way back then, before I left Ireland, about what happened. I remember um, up until that point, I would I would alternate, as I say, between the kind of like just didn't wasn't really didn't really like it. Uh, decided to make a career move, and I, sometimes I would say I started to say then I got sick. I was. I started to explain it as, oh, you know, I was working there, but then I got ill. I had to take time off work, so I, I eventually had to had to um, to quit. And then people would immediately kind of assume that it was a physical illness, you know, physical illness, like quote unquote. Um, right. And that's something, you know, I'd had some awful, like, I, I don't know, some some sort of disability had befallen me. But um, and then I evolved a little bit further. And again, it's only really in the last year that I've been comfortable saying to people outside of a, a you know, kind of a, an area like this where, or kind of a, you know, a, a space like this where you're, you're actively already talking about mental health. Doing it in kind of a workplace or something and saying, well, you know, actually, this is what happened to me. I had, I had, um, I had, as I say, I'm, I'm kind of happy enough calling it a nervous breakdown, but sometimes I'll say, you know, I was actually, I was, I became ill. I was diagnosed with panic disorder. Um, and so I had to, at the time I had to, I had to resign. Um, but it, it just, it was, it was really feeling my way through how comfortable I was admitting that was, was a real eye opener. I, I kind of didn't realize how much shame I was carrying about it and how much my, 
you know, when I unpacked that a little bit, there was a lot of my identity had been wrapped up in that career. And it had also been wrapped up in being somebody who could manage everything and somebody who could just get on with stuff and power through things. And because that was how I had coped with my blips of anxiety up until that point. I had just been like, oh, I'm nervous about this presentation. OK, just just go through it. Just do it. Um, whereas, you know, it's it's kind of the admitting to myself and to other people that actually I'm not able to cope with with this all the time was huge um huge in terms of a struggle i think i don't know if that's something that you guys have have experienced as well that kind of naming what's going on in a way that feels really genuine to yourself um and balancing that with how vulnerable that makes you to other people yeah like i know a lot of of the intention of your podcast from my understanding is to take away stigma around these things and oh yeah i think that yes. um, yeah for me i i didn't realize how much stigma there was yeah yeah and, and how of, much of that stigma is kind of again you know it was it was in my my head yeah a lot of it is oh, definitely please yeah yeah and i and i'm i'm willing exactly. to bet exactly that yeah. most of the people that you come clean with in the end are still proud of you still happy to go look you got a phd you went across the uh, the atlantic ocean to a different country where everybody gets shot to death apparently <laughs> and <laughs> you yeah. you took a huge <clears throat> you did more than most people will ever do in their entire lives and you've already accomplished it before you were 30 that's incredible mm-hmm. okay it was a little too much it got overwhelming there's yeah. nothing saying you yeah. can't get back into it again sometime in the future who knows I mean, you just never know. That's true. And you may find yourself doing something even more incredible somewhere else. Yeah. Well, I mean, even at the moment, I think about like, so I had to kind of gradually ease myself back into to just being a functioning, you know, employee in in some capacity again. And I, I did that in. I know some people's approach to to these things is like, I'll jump in at the deep end again. I'll get back out there. Get back out there. Get back on the on the horse, kind of stuff. And I know for me, you know. I have to do things incrementally. I have to do things in bite-sized pieces. So when I was living with, back with my parents and it all kind of, you know, felt like the end of the world. Um, I remember one thing that my, that my mom has said to me, and I'm very lucky because my mom is actually um, is a psychotherapist and she has a lot of experience with, obviously with, you know, kind of things like anxiety disorders for, for people, but she also has her own experience, you know, having had anxiety herself in the past. And, um, and she witnessed, she's also witnessed, I suppose the, just how crippling it can be from the point of view of of, of my dad. So my dad is, is has got quite, I would say, almost um, yeah, just just really levels of anxiety that really hinder him in in his life a lot of the time. And um, so she said to me, um, you know, whatever you do, do whatever you need for yourself. But one thing, try not to cut yourself off from people. Um, she said, just try and stay in contact with people as much as you can. Just try not to isolate um because again i think that's that's oh. she had seen you know my dad do that a lot and yeah, uh, isolation feeds into anxiety it's, it's a bad absolutely. combo absolutely yes absolutely absolutely um but that involved putting myself out there a little bit and i and i would do it in bite-sized pieces i, I had good friends I, I still have good friends that um you know when i arrived back i was able to be honest with and, and say this happened and kind of just be again very like real with them around you know i'd like to do this today i'd like to go meet you for a walk i'd like to meet you somewhere but i'm gonna need to do x y or z in order to feel comfortable there you know i'd like to go and have have a get a cup of tea with you somewhere but could we go somewhere that's not too noisy could we go for a walk instead of sitting inside you know something like that um i had to do that a lot and i was lucky everybody was you know my, my friends were really extremely accommodating about it um but you have good friends. You're lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's a, it's a kind of a it's the kind of thing that I think connecting with people at a different level like that is it can be a bit of a make or break. But by and large, my experience of that has been very positive. You know, it's it's and to this day, I'm I'm sort of I'm more comfortable having conversations like this with people that I that I you know don't know essentially like you guys. And we're straight in. We're talking about you know um quite uh raw things quite personal Mm -hmm. things and 
and it's okay and I'm comfortable with that whereas if if we were making small talk about things I think I would find that a lot more stressful um there's something yeah. just you know there's like a tension that comes with trying to pretend things are not what they are or or pretend like you're concealing something that for me yes. is just too much uh, at times um so yeah so there was a lot about a lot for me has has kind of, that's helped is is just telling people when I'm when I'm not feeling okay and being as kind of vague about that as I as I need to be at the time uh, again it took me a while to be able to say I'm having a panic attack I'm feeling panicked I was afraid if I said the word it would just bring on the kind of you know the storm yeah of it. um notice but, you're getting a lot of nodding heads <laughs> right now yeah <laughs> <Okay>. yeah <laughs> It's like you're summoning the, you know, the the Sandman. It's kind of, or the, the um, you know, it's it's kind of. But the... speak of the devil, and he shall appear. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. Oh, it's... So horrible it's... too. Yes. But we do have some like, comments yeah. from Deverne. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um. Actually, he 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 actually has a comment and a question. He says, "This is very interesting. Some sounds do that to me, also, but really, the emphasis on the sound causing me." is on the sound causing me to feel scared by planes do that for me. And I am curious if planes do that for you, since you have so much fear surrounding that experience. Oh yeah. Yeah. I find, yeah. Airplanes, as I say, it's the noise of airplanes, maybe not so much. It's, do you know what it is? It's almost like the ambient noise of an airport would set me off a little bit Mm -hmm. more because that's, that's my association is kind of being inside those situations um it's is kind of that that's what i have all the negative associations with um and there's this, so there's like specific things around being in airports that i just i, oh, I, I can, feel it just brewing you know um I, I can imagine the overwhelmingness of just so many people walking bags rolling and being you know shoved around and the occasional roar oh. of the jet taking off, the idle yeah. engines of the jets constantly whining in the background. Yeah, yeah. The constant yeah. chit chat of people talking around you. It can. Yeah, I, and, I the, to, and the constant. I, I to... Please make sure that you leave, keep your bags with you at all times. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. Just a little like it's a blip of something else to worry about. Yeah, yeah. But it never also know, said if it helps, <sighs> ma'am. I feel the same way as you, except for it's the opposite reason. Because I have not left and began my life yet. You know how you're talking about mm-hmm. yours is the opposite mm-hmm. of feeling the anxiety. Yeah, so, Becky, yeah, yeah. you were I saying. Mm. Oh, it sounds, yeah, he's he's just at a different at a different stage. It sounds like, and it's it's kind of that. Um, yeah, we, you meet people at different points. We've been pushing him, <laughs> gently pushing yeah. him, but Fine. we've been pushing him. Yeah, nudge, yeah. nudge, nudge. Yep. <laughs> well, that's it. You kind of have to move at your own at a speed that you're comfortable with, I think with this, you know, and I, yes. I got a lot of conflicting advice from people when, when, when this first started, you know, I, again, I saw a, a psychiatrist in, in the States, which was an experience um, going to the psychiatric hospital in Boston was, was really um, unusual. And again, not um, it definitely kind of an, an anxiety revoking situation in itself, but you know, the, the, the advice that I get from, from sort of doctors and things is, is very much like, take the medication, get on with your life. I remember having a, um, and yet everything in me was like, you know, I, I kind of feel like I need to do this a little bit differently. I'm not, I'm more comfortable doing this at a, at a snail's pace maybe, but, but that's, you know, that's, that's oh. something that, that feels more sustainable. And you just highlighted the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist very clearly. Is, I mean, right yeah, here, right. especially here, I don't know how it is in other nations, but here, there is that very distinct line. The psychiatrist can care about how your life is going, but it's like, here's the meds, see how it does. Where the psychologist is more like, let's work with the issues that are causing you to need these meds. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, and that was definitely, I had never seen a psychiatrist before. And the lady that I, that I met in, in Boston, um, the doctor was very, very nice, but I re- really got a sense of that. Um, you know, she didn't understand why I just wasn't taking the Lexapro and getting back to work, you know, um, oh, I had kind something. of these, <laughs> yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. you know. 
Um, but even back in Ireland, like it, it, it is, I think it might be a, um, not to tar all the medical professionals with this because I, I've had a lot of different experiences with doctors with this, but I, I remember seeing when I got back to Ireland again, seeing, um, we, for us, there are general practitioners here is like a primary care physician, I think, think type of person, a really, really, um, unsympathetic man that, that I saw when I came back, I needed to get, um, certificates signed when I came back so that I could be on kind of illness benefit and um I had to go to this man to get them signed and his attitude to me which looking back I can only assume was some sort of like in his head a cruel to be kind type of thing or a tough love approach he was he was like you know sitting in there just telling him what was going on and he was like well you know how do you think being on the dole is going to solve this you know is that your solution is are you just going to be on on kind of illness benefit forever don't you realize that you have to get back out there? Don't you realize that, you know, just this kind of, I remember sitting in his office and just tears streaming down my face and he, and it was just relentless. He kept, and then he was like, well, why are you crying? You know, don't you get it? The whole thing was like, don't you get it? And I, I remember I couldn't even get any words out. I was so, I felt so chastised and so criticized. I felt like I was a little kid. Um, and I remember all I could say to him was like, you know, I'm trying really hard. And, uh, and he just, he, he kind of like begrudgingly signed the stuff that he had to sign or whatever, but was like, you know, kind of get your shit together sort of was a message. And I remember coming out and just bawling, crying in the car uh, to my dad afterwards, who was, who was kind of livid about about it, but um, thinking afterwards that, and that hasn't been my, that hasn't been my, my experience overall, I would say with doctors, but it definitely there's there's a distinction between that approach and then you know I, I saw a lot of different therapists as well and different and people in different sort of like alternative um therapy roles as well so I, I you know I I probably ran the full kind of gamut of of different things to to help myself to help manage this and a lot of time it was my parents who were very kind of you know open to anything but they brought me to a acupuncturist. I've been to a craniosacral therapist. I went to a Buddhist nun who did mindful massage. I went to um, uh, a therapist who worked on, it was called, I think it was eye movement and desensitization therapy, where you kind of follow a line that, that goes in front of your eyes. That's, like, um, you ever you, heard of this? Yeah. If you go back to our first season and listen to the last episode with Rachel, okay, she talks about that uh, quite a bit. And also do like Great. the tapping back and forth and... The tapping. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, Ayurvedic doctor, um, you know, kind of you, you name it sort of stuff. And I'm, just, um, I'm waiting for heart sound therapy. I'm waiting to see if you tried that. What is it again? Heart sound therapy. I've not heard of that. No. Oh, okay. It's another no. one of those uh, more alternative. Uh, my wife was really big into it for a while and I went through one session and it was, it was an experience. Uh, it was like, Almost like a massage, and there were chimes and these really nice sounding little, like almost like gongs, uh, bells and um, humming, and it, it was it was interesting. It was really interesting. Tapping on my body that in specific areas, uh, it's like yeah, yeah. It was it was an experience. I don't know that it did anything for me, but it was an experience that I, I I'm so glad I had. <laughs> I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I kind of have the same the same attitude to those things. I think, you know, it's like if it works, it was, awesome. Uh, if not, hey, I tried. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I was very willing to try most things apart from, <laughs> from the medication, but I was very willing to try a lot uh, most things. And, and my attitude is very much like, you know, it couldn't hurt to try this. Um, I remember again when I was in the U.S., you know, and finding it very difficult. One of the things that made me feel better consistently was I went for reflexology um once a week to this lovely lady who lived in Jamaica Plain and um it was a time where her house was just really peaceful and quiet and she had this um she had this little dog that would come in and it would just sit under the chair while she was like rubbing my feet and um and sometimes I would actually go to sleep I was so calm and it was just so different to what was going on for me otherwise that and sometimes I would be in tears in, in there for for no reason and she always just um, and I think that was that's the thing with a lot of, of these um, alternative therapists is that they have a knack for sort of just engaging with you on a personal level that is, regardless of what else they're doing, that is so soothing and healing. Um, in that moment, that's kind of providing 
what what's for me anyway that that provided what I needed there and then was just this nice quiet presence of somebody she was very reassuring she didn't say a whole lot but it was just this kind of sense of like her calmness rubbed off on me a little bit and it was completely okay if I if I was upset if I was crying in there she wouldn't kind of you know go oh my god what's going on she would just be like this is okay too and it was just it was so um, she just took it in stride exactly exactly I remember sending her a card when I got back to Ireland um just to say thank you because I was so it was you know when when you're going through something like that um the world seems full of hard edges at, at times and you and you get you're you're very kind of suddenly very very raw to it all but these little um you know moments or or kind of uh, gestures that people do can can mean so much um probably disproportionate to the amount of effort that it takes them to do it that I really wanted to to express that it was it was just there was a few people that I kind of met when I was in Boston again there was another therapist that I had that also kind of provided that space for me but um but yeah and I and I, and I was so grateful at the time for just um for just having this this kind of other perspective on it and I think some of it was that I didn't have any I wasn't over there with my family or anything so I, I felt very alone um and having a kind of comforting adult it felt like there a lot of the time was was so helpful um for me but um but back in Ireland like the, the thing about the, the psychiatrist versus the the therapist I kind of I have I, I remember seeing actually I haven't seen a psychiatrist in Ireland but I have seen a couple of cardiologists here um just you know again my parents in their in their infinite patience uh took me to arranged for me to go to a couple of different um, consultant cardiologists to check the, the stuff that I was experiencing with my with my harsh uh, rhythms because I was just getting it was it was just becoming so disruptive to my life I remember um you know I did things like cut out caffeine I cut out uh you know I, I wasn't taking anything to kind of potentially give me any any arrhythmia like that but I remember one time having a, a cup of tea almost like kind of by accident. I didn't realize it had been brewed for so long. And in Ireland, tea is like, you know, tea is life. You don't go anywhere and not have a cup of tea. And uh, and I had an arrhythmia of about 30 minutes that sent me to the to the emergency room. So I went to cardiologist after that, who was extremely patient and understanding about, you know, the fact that to him was probably a very obvious case of just somebody coming in with a healthy heart who was suffering from very profound anxiety he explained to me all about, you know, you might be extra sensitive to this, receptors for adrenaline in the heart, all of these different things. He showed me the scans, he did the echo, he did the the trace and everything. And um, it was just, again, it was that little bit of just, you know, it probably took a couple of extra minutes out of his day. But to me, it felt like somebody was acknowledging that it was okay for me to be worried about this. It was you know, a it was safe like, harbor in the it, storm he wasn't that dismissing it. Precisely, precisely. And those safe harbors are, are, you know, they can feel really few and far between when, when you're, when you're in a bad way. So it's, um, yeah, it's really, really appreciated, I suppose. Um, yeah. And, uh, it's interesting. Like I, I kind of admire what you're doing here with the podcast as providing a space like that for, you know, for, for kind of, um, like I'm not trying, I'm not trying to just like flatter you meaninglessly now, but I I think that you know providing a space where it is okay to talk about this stuff is really significant for people. It's um, again I don't know about the kind of the general culture of this in, in the states. I, I wasn't there for long enough, but in Ireland it's becoming much more acceptable to say to to voice you know your 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 mental health struggles and, and to kind of identify them a bit more and, and to ask for help. Um, and this is only in maybe the last 10 years or so, because we're, we're a country that's, you know, historically used alcohol to deal with a lot of things used, you know, um, there's a, there's a kind of a culture of, you know, sort of keeping things to yourself and secrecy and this kind of a small village mentality and the Catholic church being quite overbearing about anything that, um, you know, was in any way, disruptive or or kind of made you act in a way that that wasn't um compatible with with what they wanted to to have happen and um so it's definitely only in the last I, I would say 10 years or so that it's really become you know much more acceptable for we've had like sports people and um you know musicians and all of this stuff kind of people coming out talking about their their own struggles with them um, 
with mental health problems and um the thing i hate the most you see was, a lot more kind of the thing i hate the most is when please, a celebrity yeah. does come out and talks about their me- the struggles with mental health they get ridiculed and it's like yeah. they are under intense pressure to perform mm. at the highest levels consistently yeah that could screw with your mental health and you may already have issues yeah. before you even get involved in it i mean there are people too don't don't be like Oh, look at this millionaire who's crying about their mental health. You know what? Mental health hit, it hits everyone. Yeah. Yes, they are in a good yeah. They are in a good position to be able to get the best care and more power to mm-hmm. them for it. And maybe, maybe with any luck, they don't pass it on to their children. You know, yeah. maybe they're in that yeah. kind of a situation. And you know, again, more power to them. But I say thank you for stepping forward and you know and talking about it. Like seriously. I completely agree. Yeah, I think that having a platform like that and using it for that kind of a message rather than, <clears> you know, something more more <throat> trivial and meaningless is is really admirable. Um, and again, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's just normalizing these types of conversations and it's normalizing um, that, that thing of just, I don't know, that you see it a lot here, the, the kind of the posters and things that we have this, this phrase that they seem to use is like, it's okay to not be okay. Um, and we have a t-shirt that year. says that. Do you have that too? <laughs> yeah, t- we do. <laughs> I, made, I, I made one I on like our that. store. <laughs> we have, Yeah. We have It's Okay to Not Be Okay. We have, uh, for people that want to join the podcast, you know, uh, come uh, listen and be heard. Because even that's if great. you're not the one talking, sometimes you'll hear your life story being told. And you're like, that's it. Oh, yeah. That's it. I'm being heard without even saying a word. Yeah, we have a few yeah. of those. Yeah. That's nice. I must look at that afterwards because I'm, um, yeah, that, yeah. The, the message really resonates with me, actually, that that sense of being, well, as you say, being heard, even if, if you're not the one saying anything, but you hear somebody else saying it, that's, you see yourself represented in some way. Again, it's all about isolation, I think, but yeah. it, it's taking down that kind of um, popping the, the, the bubble that you feel like you're in. Um, I will say that and, I hope you saw C's face when you were talking about that doctor that did the tough love thing. Because it was full blown. C wanted an arm long enough to reach across the Atlantic Ocean and backhand him to the point where it's like, you know what? Forget the backhand. I'm grabbing a knife and I'm stabbing him. <laughs> that was the Believe faces me. I saw. <laughs> I, I, How I accurate was that, that. C? I, I got to go bash some kneecaps, man. <laughs> totally accurate. <laughs> Let's go do it mafioso style. <laughs> Yes. Let me go get Lucille. Ooh, Walking Dead style. <laughs> <laughs> easy, y'all laugh, easy, but... lemon squeezy. <laughs> I was like, y'all laugh. I have a Lucille in my living room. <laughs> I'm not even. So, if are you familiar with Lucille from The Walking Dead? I think I stopped watching The Walking Dead after maybe. Oh. I'm gonna say. The third season or so, I I kind of just lost the, the I plot. Loved, literally, yeah, <laughs> I loved the first season. Second season lost me. Yeah. But yeah. Lucy, uh, when yeah. Negan came in, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, if I remember his name correctly, I hope I said yes. Right. Oh yes, and yes. he had yes, that yes, baseball yes. bat with the barbed wire. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's Lucille. That's Lucille. That was that's there definitely. It is. Oh wow! Look at that. Oh my god! That's gonna be used to break that man's ye- kneecaps. I will borrow that. That is if hardcore. that doesn't work. <laughs> I have two of these. Is that a katana? Yes, wow. it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Are these like sort of ornamental or functional? Katanas like... aren't. <laughs> <laughs> Those are very real. <laughs> yeah, my son. No, I, I mean like. I'll go for Do it. you have them for sort of? Are, are they there decoratively, or are you are you afraid you're going to have to use them? Oh no, they're 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 collector things for me. But but don't don't mistake it. I would totally <laughs> bust out Lucille on somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just the thought of seeing that bat coming at you is just terrifying, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, no, there's... Sorry, um, you were going to say something about your yeah, son. Yeah, my son, he actually has... Um, I can't remember the name of the sword. It's the sword from The Legend of Zelda. Like, the... The Master Sword. Yeah, he has the Master Sword, and it is the weapons-grade high carbon steel where if you touch it, you can damage the blade. Because mm-hmm. your own oils on your skin can damage the blade. 
And it is balanced well. I mean, it is a truly masterpiece of a sword. I was like, dude, I don't even want to know how much you spent on that thing. I just... Yeah. I I want one. (laughs) Yeah, I mean... It's a beautiful sword. It is. <laughs> How old is your son? He's, he's obviously... Uh, did he tw- pay for that himself? <laughs> he, he did. He's 26. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah and he's yeah, the one absolutely. that has the grandbaby that lives only a couple blocks from me. I get to oh, see my granddad. I can't believe you're a granddad. You definitely seem not old enough for that. Well, thank you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm 44. Wow. You're doing something right, because you don't look at it at all. Well, thank you. I, I think it's uh, having a good attitude and not wanting to grow up. Also, yeah, I helps, rarely yeah. drink. I don't yeah. smoke. I, I'm i pretty straight edge. Now, yeah, I there was yeah. a time that I was Mr. Wake and Bake, so I was stoned all yeah. the time. But I also worked at Burger King, so come on, give me a break. <laughs> yeah, you might need something to, to sweeten that, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but and I, is that was that decision to kind of not drink and and to cut that out? Was that for your your kind of your your mental well being as part of? Yeah, well, I never, I have stuff? never tried a cigarette or any tobacco in my life. Um, I watched Me either. Yeah. yeah, my parents were both smokers, and I just remember as a kid just how much it would just I'd kill my appetite. Go to eat breakfast, and the thing mm-hmm. was, finish eating before mom and dad wake up. Because it's going to smell like smoke and you're not going to be able to eat anymore. And that was with him with dinner. Finish dinner before they did. You know, it was constantly that. Although there was one time when we were at this restaurant. It was a Mexican restaurant called Lalo's. Amazing Mexican food. Like, you wouldn't expect a little Italian town to have authentic Mexican food, but it was there. <laughs> and it, this is back where they still allowed public smoking in California. And I told my mom flat out, because my dad had quit at that point. I told my mom, if you light up, I will fart. And... She's like, okay, oh, no. whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah, she decided to light up, and I farted, and she put it out. <laughs> you are well trained. <laughs> yeah, but no, I used to smoke a lot of weed, but then I started getting panic attacks, so I quit weed. Yeah, um, I, that's interesting. When, after my first divorce, my so far only divorce, might stay that way. <laughs> it would be nice. We'll see. You know? <laughs> only time will tell. Yeah. But um, after that, I wound up doing, uh, I was DJing at a dive bar uh, four nights a week and then I moved to doing KJ and I got three free drinks a night. Well, I was doing Tokyo teas. If you're familiar with uh, the Long Island iced tea. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, change the, add in Midori. Just add a shot of Midori and take away the cola and make it Sprite instead so it's green. That's what I was drinking. I was drinking three pint size. Tokyo Tees, slamming them just back to back to back, and I didn't feel a thing. And that was when I went, hmm, I'm developing a drinking problem. I should probably quit. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I'm so glad I had that moment of clarity, because I have a feeling that had I ignored it, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. really interesting. And it's really interesting what you're saying about the smoking pot and, um, and the panic attacks as well, because again, it's one of those things that I didn't do any of that when I was at the age where everybody was doing that and now I feel like I'm both too old to start doing it and also have too much like you know as in it's the same thing with with adding with the Lexapro it's like my brain's already capable of some pretty kind of creating some pretty unpleasant experiences for me I don't really want to give it an extra sort of um tool here with which is like throwing some other chemicals into it um and I've had friends that have had um, kind of panic attacks. The whole, their, the whole start of their their panic attack journey was brought on by by mushrooms or by um, or by marijuana, and it's kind of um, I like mushrooms. Such an old person <laughs> calling it the marijuana. Yeah. <laughs> well, and again, it, you hear kind of conflicting things because for some people, it's it's really um, it's really kind of curative, and it and it helps their anxiety a lot of the time. Well, so, so I don't know. I think it's here's the thing that I didn't know about when I was a stoner. There are two main strains of pot. There's indica and sativa there's sativa. and indica. Yep. Oh. One will amp you up and one will mellow you out. I don't remember which is which, mm. though. But indica, indica calms you out. down. Sativa, uh, sativa makes you... gives you energy. Yeah. So like, yeah. So apparently, like, like purple Kush must have been indica because that just mellowed me out and I liked it. 
but there were some other types of, of strains I've had where I'd get like that amped up, and I, I when I was younger it was great. As I got older, it became panic attacks, and I remember I yeah. quit on my birthday. <laughs> so my birthday is when I celebrate quitting. And that was That's twelve great. years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's like now, like my now it says it's all legalized. You know, you can get exact dosages, you know, of everything. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot more controlled now. Where in the nineties and early two thousands, it was you got what you got, and yeah, and you didn't know if it was unless you knew the grower. You didn't know if it got mm-hmm. mixed with anything or what, you know, because uh, mm-hmm. it was not uncommon for uh, pot in especially California to get laced uh, with either like cocaine or meth or Ooh. yeah. Now it's fentanyl. Yeah, now it's fentanyl. God. And fentanyl is scary dangerous. Yeah. <sighs> like the amount of Jesus. like if you compare a lethal dose of fentanyl to a lethal dose of heroin. It is my. It, it is uh, so much smaller. Yeah, it's like microscopic compared to heroin. Good God! It it takes two milli, milligrams, I think, milliliters. Probably milligrams. It's very small dosage, just two, and you're dead. Where heroin takes considerably more. I mean, fentanyl is yeah. scary deadly, and we are having a. We're having a shit time with it here in the States. We really are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and um, and it's like, I'm not trying to blame any nationality because obviously whichever nation can produce mm. it, it's not the government typically doing it. It's other people that are doing it. But most of the fentanyl that we're getting is coming mm. in from China. Like there are cargo ships with okay. like entire, like one cargo bin stuff with fentanyl. And I mean, that's yeah. enough to kill every American three times over. And that's the stuff's getting shipped here. And how do you stop it? The Pacific Ocean is huge. The Pacific Coast yeah. of California is huge. Yeah, a lot of access points. Yeah, and it's like they don't even have to bring it into the U.S. They could bring it to, well, there's some pretty empty areas in northern Canada. And then you fly it in. Mm-hmm. There's empty areas all along Mexico. And that's a huge coast. And you can fly it in, yeah. truck it in. It's It's crazy. Like the war against drugs is... I, I don't agree with the war against drugs at all. I think that we should be focusing that money mm. on education, rehabilitation. Um, yeah. Yeah. Stop throwing people in jail for it. Stop making Help a black market. Better. And honestly, I say just yeah. leak. I, I, and I know this is, this is, I try not to get too political, but this is one where both sides have made a lot of talk, but have done nothing. And the war on drugs, legalize mm. everything, focus on, um, focus on education and rehabilitation, get rid of the black market completely. You legalize it, all the crime, all the, the, the gang crimes vanish overnight because mm. the black market's gone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the same here, actually, as well as any of the kind of the calls to legalize, um, to legalize weed in Ireland. It's a lot of it is around taking, the hand, taking it out of the, the hands of the... The gangs, we, we kind of, I mean, Ireland is not the worst case of this kind of thing, but we have a lot of gangland violence um, in, we'll say, like Dublin and maybe like pockets in other, in other cities as well, but, but kind of Dublin and Limerick are probably the worst for it. And, um, and it's all down, as you say, to just the power that they have because they're the only ones that are really running the show. So, yeah, there's, there's kind of a, a whole campaign to just get it, um, legal and for and for medical purposes as well, you know the the kind of um, the therapeutic doses of um, of THC and stuff. So and yeah, even CBD um, is amazing. For- exactly. Yeah. 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 It, you, have you have you um, tried that for anxiety? I haven't tried it yet. I I want to. My wife is pretty strong against it because she still has that old stigma okay. about the THC aspect of it. It's like, look, it's a body high, mm. not a mental high. It's supposed to help relax the body. I would really like that. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. But a part of it also is that she's a registered nurse, so we have to be careful of what's in the house. Uh, so, yeah. again, you. that's why I have to be a little yeah. more cautious about it. It's like, yeah, I'd like to try it, but until she gets the green light from her work, yeah, yeah probably not happening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting the way you describe it. So it's like, your mind is still pretty kind of um, like unobstructed, you know, lucid, and clear. Or, or okay, but you're noticing a sort of 
just a, a relaxation in in your body from kind of the, the brain down, is it? Right. And I mean, anxiety causes your body Sounds to good. get tense. It's great yeah. for anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. That's really interesting. Because again, I, I just find I'm, I'm afraid of things like that. As in, I'm afraid of sort of triggering anything. I'm afraid, like, not that I want to live my life quite so sheltered, but it's, I'm very careful about things like that that could potentially sort of um do something biochemically that i'm that i'm not asking for um in the same way that i don't drink tea or coffee because of the caffeine and i know it's just you know it would just give me um sensations that i you know just wouldn't wouldn't enjoy um and the same way if i go to the dentist now just to kind of go back to where i was at the start but if I go to the dentist now i ask i have to ask for a different um local anesthetic the one that comes without the adrenaline because again it's like I don't think it's going to kill me at this point. I think it could probably bring on a panic attack and I'm just not, I just don't want to have to deal with it. You know, it's, it's like, I, again, I, I'd love to be one of those people who's just like, bring it on. I can, I can deal with it all now. I can confront it and just have it wash over me. And I've never really been able to get to that place with it. I'm still, I think at a stage where I'm like, you know what? I'd like to avoid it. And I'd like to avoid the triggering stuff as much as possible. Um, and I wouldn't like to, I don't want to live in a bubble, but I'm going to be cautious about what I'm exposing myself to. Um, so I think that, yeah, I, I'm, I'm jealous that I don't have the experiences that some people have with, with things like, um, again, things like LSD or with, um, or even with pot. Um, Ooh, I, I know better than to ever try LSD. My personality, yeah, I was gonna say, it'd be a freaking mm-hmm. disaster. Shrooms? Sure. Yeah. LSD. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. Mm. Mm. Mescaline. Any of that yeah. stuff. No. Yeah. Peyote. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that it's right. Like, and I and I gather like if you have any kind of pre-existing anxiety disorder, you're probably pretty. It's a pretty heavy contraindication for for taking anything like that. But um, yeah, it's um, it's it's certainly something that I feel like it's. There's, there's certain doors that are closed to me now um, because of just what I'm aware of in my in myself. Um, but well, quite honestly, yeah, I, I guess just throwing it out there, um, mm-hmm. it's probably better to be aware and be cautious as opposed to just throw a caution in yeah. the wind and find yourself in an ER going, "What the fuck happened?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, did but I have I mean, fun? Think- <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And why does my right butt cheek hurt? Wait, a tattoo? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, but I I kind of, it it brings the question to mind for me as well. It's like, you know, I I wouldn't like to think that I'm avoiding things. Like, do you feel like you live in your life kind of with with avoidance of of things that are going to bring on anxiety or, or low mood? Or do you... That's actually something that Rachel kind of really it? helped me with because um, for a long time, like I grew up in a town of 3,500 people mm-hmm. and then I moved to San Diego. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. So you're talking about your little village in mm-hmm. Ireland and then moving to Boston. I'm like, yeah, relatable. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. I don't like crowds, but I've been working on mm-hmm. trying to be able to be okay in crowds because there's so many things in life that have to do with crowds. Like, I mean, if I want to take my kids to Disneyland because it's magical place for them, um, I got to be able to be okay with that, you know, and, uh, concerts. Like I tend to not do indoor concerts at all. Well, mainly because I don't like my ears bleeding because the sound can't escape. I like amphitheaters. (laughs) Uh, but Mm -hmm. even then I have a hard time. It's gotta be something like really, really right up my alley to make me even want to go. Um, since mm-hmm. my, div- like before my divorce, I went to three concerts since I've only been to two and I used to actually perform on stage and tour up and down the West coast. And I used to play in front okay. of 10,000 people. So it, for me to be like, it's, it's one thing to be on stage cause you're alone <laughs> yeah. or it's a small group. But it's a different story being in the crowd. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's something very primitive about the sense of danger in that situation, I think, or the sense for potential danger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, in situations like that. Yeah, mine yeah, is uh, mine's like a separation anxiety, being separated from the people I came with. Oh yeah, like I yeah. would probably really be a lot that. better at a concert by myself, but then mm. I'd be bored to tears because I'm not sharing it with somebody. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, just, it's a catch twenty two. Mm. 
It is a bit, yeah. But I really, I hear what you're saying about that kind of, you don't, you know, there's certain things that you just, by the nature of, of how you live your life, you're going to be exposed to it. And I, and I, you know, I don't want to be somebody who, like, I didn't want to be somebody who would never fly again because I love traveling. Um, so it took me a while, but I will. For me, that is so alien. I love flying. Really? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's I so, get very so the claustrophobia doesn't flights. Do you? Uh, yeah. And is it, is it a claustrophobia thing for you, Bexie? It, I, it's not necessarily a claustrophobia thing, although I don't like small spaces. Mm-hmm. For me, it's 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 more of a. I, I'm not sure what makes me panic when I get on a plane, and I I don't fly often. Yeah. Uh, the last time I did was a couple years ago, um, and I actually, um, I flew from Texas to Florida, and then back again, and. It was it was awful. By the time I got off the plane and back in Texas, I was so sick that I had I had actually panicked the entire flight basically and made myself sick. And I had to come home and just like I I crashed on the couch for like three hours and woke up feeling better, but I was just so exhausted by the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I, that's that sounds really familiar. It's very draining on your system just having that kind of overload of of stress hormone with no with nothing to do with it. Um, yeah. What about you? Sam? I knew I could. Oh, sorry, because she's been going. Oh, okay. the, uh, uh, uh. Go ahead. <laughs> I know for me, it's particularly hard to try to uh, find what my triggers are, especially for my anxiety or depression, because. It's just basically like a, like a pen, what is it called? A pendulum swing or whatever. Yeah. It yeah. can go mm-hmm. from one way, like I'll be having an okay day. Then all of a sudden I can be feeling completely just not me, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Either I get super low and I'm just not feeling myself the entire day and weeks after or I'm super anxious and the thoughts are racing in my head and I can't do anything about it. So I just kind of sit there and (laughs) yes, it's very hard to avoid things that I don't really know some of the triggers are. Um, Like E said, uh, one of them is, one I did identify is crowds. Um, I haven't ever tried working on that because there's not many crowds where I am. So I'll be working on that in the future, I suppose. Also with COVID, crowds just kind of stopped being a thing. Exactly. Yes, that too. They, they did. Yeah. That's, you know, that was one of my big things. I do not like to be surrounded by tons and tons of people. And I think that mm-hmm. is one of the triggers for me being on a plane is that I am trapped in this metal box with all of these people surrounding me and I, I don't like it. I don't, I don't want to deal with these people. You're in, and a, I'm, yeah. you're in a flying metal cigar built by the lowest bidder. And, <laughs> and on top of that, I'm an empath. Whatever anybody feels around me, I'm picking up on, I'm bombarded constantly by the feelings of everybody around me. And if I don't find a way to shut that off, it drives me crazy. I, I couldn't shut it off the last time I flew. I was, I had, <laughs> I admit I, it was for fun. I had gone to Florida. I went to a supernatural convention. It was awesome. I met some of the I, best people. I tried to get you there. I tried, I tried, I tried. I know. I really <laughs> wanted to go and I couldn't because I was unemployed. And I never got to go to a supernatural convention. That's my, that hurts so much. They still have them. For now. I gotta go before they end them. <laughs> as long as Mark um, is there, I want to go. But, um, so, coming back from it, I, I didn't, you know, properly prepare myself for this, so I was bombarded the entire flight by everybody's emotional state, and by the time I got home, it's almost like I have to just lock myself away and decompress from all of that, and I, I need to recharge, and no, it sounds like we all have to travel together and let my happy mood and be infectious and be like, 
Good, we're going flying! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, and I know you're joking, but it's like, in a way, that's kind of, that's what helps me. I, I find, and I'm, I'm one of those people where it's like, the sensations of anxiety and the sensations of excitement are so similar in my body and how they feel that if I don't frame them in a particular way and say, now I'm anxious, now I'm actually excited, then it just, it can tip from one to the other. Like I, I was one of those kids that I would get so worked up about going to a birthday party, party that I'd make myself physically ill. Um, and as an adult, I, I've noticed the same thing. I, I, I kind of find it hard sometimes to sort of the jitteriness that I get with, with looking forward to something um, can easily tip into to anxiety. And, you know, something like traveling, I sometimes have to, I've tried really hard to just relabel it for myself as like, I'm excited about this trip, not, you know, necessarily that I'm overwhelmed with dread about this trip. Um, but like you were saying, Bexy, it's like, I think when it comes to, to traveling and, and being in the airplane, for me, it's like, it's not even the thing of, you know, of crashing or anything like that. I have, that actually almost is, is the least of my concerns. It's very much the, the being in the box with all the people. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of people are probably are, are anxious on an airplane. That's why, I mean, there's bars in the airport in, in Ireland. And it was certainly a lot of people's <laughs> yeah. suggestion to me when I, when I started talking about it, they were like, well, would you not just have a drink before you get on the plane? It was like, that's what everybody kind of does. And then have another couple of drinks on the plane. It was like, it's called, you know, a lot courage. of people are, are kind of, yeah, yeah, exactly. And a lot of people are, are, are chasing that with a Xanax as well or something. And it's just, that's just what you do. So it's, you know, it's a situation that is, anxiety provoking for for humans i guess um and uh, th that's what i tell myself anyway to, to kind of be okay with with still having trouble with it but um but i always think that you know any any situation like that if i can um if i can bring it back to just you know other people in this situation other people here likely are feeling the same way as me at the moment um you know i, I could be sitting next to somebody in the airplane and they they seem completely fine and they have their shit together and i'm here you know, sweating buckets. I remember like the first couple of flights that I was on where I was actively having a panic attack in the flight. I remember asking the air hostess for ice because I was just overheating so much. And she brought me a glass with just ice in it. And I put it in my hands and just like melted it like Satan straight away. It was just like, um, I was just sweating and roasting. And, um, and I couldn't kind of, at the time again, I wasn't totally sure what was going on, but now... I know it's just a, a circulation thing and all oh, your muscles kind of are, are starting to get very metabolically active, but it's, um, it, it's one of those things where I had to normalize for myself. I had to be like, you know, that person is probably anxious and that person is probably anxious or, or uncomfortable as well. So it's, it's the sense of just constantly for me, it's about, it's about taking away that, that thing of just, I'm the only person experiencing this. I am completely alone in it versus you know everybody is walking around with a version of their own um you know of their own troubles and 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 if people are i suppose open to expressing it it certainly makes the world feel like a safer place for for me anyway um yeah it's um it's interesting like I, at the moment i'm doing and for the last kind of couple of years i've been doing some training as um a facilitator for kind of mental health groups, I suppose, is the, is the best way of describing it. Um, pretty small kind of community groups, and we're doing some online at the moment, but um, it's all, our, and it's it's run by a charity, and we do kind of things around stress management and personal development, but bring in a lot of things around anxiety and, and depression, obviously, and it's, again, it's for me, it's like the whole purpose is providing this space where you can, um, where you can kind of have very real conversations with people. You can strip away the kind of the stuff of, you know, the weather and how was your day and even, you know, kind of the stuff around COVID at the moment and just get to like, you know, how are you feeling right now? And whatever way you're feeling, whatever you're bringing is fine. You know, nobody is going to try and fix you in this space. Nobody is going to try and criticize you. It's just whatever's going on is going on. Um, and I'd, I, I guess I'd like to think that, you know, the more the, the the more frequent we can kind of have these types of conversations with people, the more um, the more that stigma you remove and, and the more comfort you can you can bring to people. Like you were saying, those those little patches of kind of um, of consolation, I suppose, or, or solace or something that you can find are, are very very important when yeah. when you're low. And um, you mentioned something earlier about here in the states how we deal with mental health. 
it really yeah. is a regional thing more than anything. Like some regions is... that you're in, it's very, you know, mental health is health. And there's still some pockets around here where it's, you bury that shit deep and you drink your problems away. And then, of course, that <laughs> one always leads to, and you beat your kids and you kick your dog. And yeah, no. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a mixed bag out here. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, yes. geographically, we're huge. Like the United States is larger than yeah. the EU combined. We're the third exactly. most populous country in the world. Yeah, we got everything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's why like, when people Completely. that's when people are like, America has a lot of deaths there dear, for COVID. It's like, well, we're the third largest nation by population. Of course, we're going to have a lot of deaths. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Like, it's a game it's a bit... of numbers. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's and like you look yeah, over at China and India; they had a lot of deaths. Well, that's number one and number two. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like there's a trend. Yeah, yeah, right. It's like that's why you're supposed to adjust for population by using the per capita or per ten thousands. Mm-hmm. Oh no! Exactly, exactly. It's um, and so it really, I, I kind of. If I'm hearing you correctly, it, it depends. Does it depend on sort of the infrastructure of a particular area in terms of mental health supports? Or is it more about, I suppose, things like... Um... It follows more political lines than anything. Yeah, honestly. that's, that's it what It really does. Yeah. Like the bluer mm-hmm. the state, the more mental health uh, awareness there is. The redder the state, the less okay. there is. Um, although, overall trend, we're getting better as a nation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, well, one of my places I worked at, it was very common to hear on the floor, mental health is health. And that came from the Great. top down. Like, even the highest... Okay, it's one of the largest corporations in the world. And the person that ran this center reported directly to the CEO, who happens to be one of the most powerful people in the world, because of this corporation... I can't name it, because... <laughs> yeah, you're, like, quite almost saying it. Yeah, but... um. I was there for six years and even they would come around and say mental health is health. If like to even like someone who's brand new on the job, if they're having a bad day, it's like, do you have any time mm-hmm. saved up? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Take the day off. But yeah. it's just, it's just stress. Duh. It's stress. It's a killer. <laughs> it's a yeah. silent yeah. killer. Mental health is health. Take the day. Yeah. It's like we give you That's all great. these days for a reason. <laughs> Yeah, and it's becoming well. It's becoming a lot more normal here to talk about things like taking a mental health day for your for yourself from work. So it's now I don't know if that's something that people really express to you know their employer, but it's certainly uh, amongst amongst your peers. You might you might admit to to that being the case. I suppose. Yeah. So well, even it's... even my current company, like say if I get off a like if I work a case and it was challenging for whatever reason, the customer is just like mm. say belligerent, hard headed, whatever. I really haven't had that problem yet, but it can happen. They're like, look, you just tell your boss, you know, I need five minutes to get my mind together. And they'll be like, go for it. They all did the same job, which I love about this company is that even like three levels above me, they have done my job. So they get it. (laughs) So that way, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, even if it comes down from, yeah. So even if it's coming down from above a little bit going, Hey, how come this person's not doing that? Oh, they're having a mental, they're taking some time off for mental health. Oh, okay. Good for them. It's it's awesome. Okay. That's great. That's yeah, we, great. Attitude. We even have our own hotline that we can reach out to twenty four seven for mental wow. health. Brilliant. Yep. Wow. That's really Yeah, wow. <laughs> and is that kind of um 'cause I think like we have things like that in a you know, employee assistance programs here they're called and again it's like, you know, you can get free sort of like six sessions of counselling free from, from your through your workplace and unlimited kind of phone line service like that that you're talking about yep. and it's confidential and everything but it's um i don't know if it is um i don't know how widely kind of embraced it is i think people still suspect that their employer is going to find out at some level because i access this you know counseling through my through my organization my employer is still going to find out somehow and again there's a sort of a well, an implication there that there's a stigma attached around here though like um what's funny is my last two companies they use it's a th- it's the same third party. That's how they get ensure that privacy. It's a third party. Uh, yeah. They can't yeah. cross that line. That line is okay. heavily enforced. Yeah. Yeah. And Kat just oh, threw great. out there amazing. I have never worked anywhere with that kind of support. Yeah, the, the, the line is, is uh, the company's called Concern. You just call Concern. Okay. 
and they will hook you up with the uh, a qualified therapist for uh, six free sessions provided by the employer. <laughs> And it's it's amazing. Yeah, that's so that's very that's quite sounds similar to our system by the sounds of it. Yeah, yours is the same. What was that? See, I said that is amazing. It is like I, I back in the nineties and two thousands working, you never heard of that stuff. Get into the twenty teens and now twenty twenties, and it's starting to become more and more commonplace. Like I worked for yeah. one of the largest corporations <laughs> in the world, and now I work for. It's not a it's not a huge company, but we are global, <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's a. Uh, I seriously love my job. I seriously love my job. <laughs> like, yeah, and, and I'm not saying that just because somebody mm. might be listening because I didn't even advertise. I, was, I had a podcast <laughs> today. I usually do. I forgot to do it today. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. no, I seriously love my job, and I love that they do all this stuff. You know, they don't have to. There's no laws, regulations, or requirements to do it. And I think that because it's voluntarily being done, it's the best way. Mm-hmm. No one's yeah. going to be resentful over it. They're doing it out of the yeah. kindness of their own hearts, going, look, you are valuable. You do matter. Yes, we do make money off of you, but your well-being matters to us because you do matter. You know, you're, we're, we're interdependent here. You know, it's a symbiotic relationship. You can't just look at it as, oh, they're just employees. When they're done, get rid of it, get a new one. Uh, yeah, well, mm. guess what? Eventually, you have nothing but broken employees everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And that's all you have to choose from is which one's less broken. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So it's nice seeing this paradigm shift. It really is. It really, mm-hmm. And that's a really, um, it's, it, yeah, as I say, it's a really like refreshing attitude change, isn't it? It's just, I don't know. Um, like, it, it, it's probably slightly different here. We're, we're still a country that's caught up a lot with... Um, like in a lot of ways, Ireland, we have big cities, but we have, and we have the big organizations that have come over from the US. Like I joke about the tax haven stuff, but you know, we have Google and Facebook and Apple and whatever here. And they've brought a sort of a corporate culture that I think, you know, okay, there's, there's, there's elements of it that are probably not totally wholesome um, in terms of, of what's expected of people, but there's definitely, they, they might have brought a little bit of that sort of, um, openness or uh support that that's sort of you know assumed to be provided i think you know there's probably an element of that having come in as well um because just because america is is slightly more progressive than us when when it comes to 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 talking about these things i think um in a lot of ways our country is with even despite the big cities we're still Mm -hmm. uh, ireland is a lot of little villages and towns kind of joined up in parts but but there's a lot of, there's still a lot of rural isolation. Um, well, I mean, and... it sounds like Ireland's a microcosm of the United States. We have the big coastal elites, and then the rest of the country is mm-hmm. known as flyover country. It's all rural, yeah. and yeah. the people in the cities don't understand the people in the country. The people in the country don't understand the people in the cities. And then they wonder why there's conflicts. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And it's like I'm from small. I'm from that rural area, and I've also I've been spending uh, almost half my life now in the big city area. I could see both sides now. And it's a really yeah. nice thing to be able to see. And I could look at both sides and go, okay, you both have valid points, but you're all both really stupid at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Just unite in your stupidity. It's <laughs> Yeah, yes, it's like you're yeah. stupid in different ways, but in some ways you're identically stupid. You're ignorant of the other yeah. side and you're refusing to listen. That's stupid. <laughs> yeah. But that's the oh, problem no, is that both sides, yeah, both sides want to be heard. Neither side's mm. willing to listen because they both want to be heard so bad. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If even one side would just listen, the other side would listen in response. Definitely. I don't know. I, I, I totally agree. I think there's kind of a mutual respect um, that needs to be, or, you know, that kind of a, a safety around expressing yourself in, in whatever capacity that, that, that isn't there a lot of the time with, with these sorts of um conflicts with people um it's, it's interesting the way you frame it like i didn't think of it like that but i suppose that idea of there being the big city and the more rural isolated folk in in ireland there's probably still a bit more traffic between those two you know types of, of situations i suppose you know people will often still work in the big city but they might go back to their parents at the weekend who live quite rurally or something like that um 
and you do notice like I was one of those people who left the small village to go to like the big city to go to college and our big city would not be anything close to, to yours but it was um you come back home then and you kind of you, you look at the, the small villages with a fresh pair of eyes and you realize that the conversations are different and that <laughs> there's a certain amount of kind of um of just sort of withholding and um people protecting themselves or isolating or or kind of maybe being um just defensive around around certain things that are going on for them um that you don't get in in you know especially like a university city like like where i was in, in cork um where you've a younger population who are much more open about what's going on for them and and there's a there's a culture that springs up around that um and at the same like time in, in they're, Ireland, they're kind of closed off to the rural areas and don't really understand what rural life really is that's that's true as well yeah it's kind absolutely. of like like okay as an example the gun debate here in the u.s the people in yeah. the cities do they really need guns well probably not as much you know as say someone in rural areas where the closest response for a cop is over an hour away and you have feral hogs that will kill you <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Uh, you have black bears. They will kill you. You have mountain lions. Mm. I had one stalk me and try and hunt me down. Uh, if it wasn't for my dogs, I probably would have been pounced upon. You know, it's, it's – they're worlds apart, even though I could drive yeah. two hours to get to it, you know, to, to bridge that yeah. gap. You're only two hours apart, but you might as well be worlds apart if you've never experienced it yeah. on either side. Yeah. And I mean, I have to admit, I was terrified of the city when I got, when I moved in. Yeah. Now, it is what it is. <laughs> it's home. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I like the suburbs. I still hate going downtown. Again, it's the crowds. Yeah. It's the, the, the way people yeah. drive <laughs> in downtowns is different than it is in <laughs> suburbs. It's just different than in the urban areas. Yeah. And the suburbs and the mm. urban areas have a lot more in common than the downtown. The downtown is insane. Mm. And does anybody really live there, or is it kind of oh yeah pure business district? Yeah, oh, okay. Jesus. Oh yeah, um, yeah. If you ever come out to Sacramento, I'll take you to Midtown. Okay, <laughs> it's uh, there's the the term that they like to use for Midtown is it's janky. What does that mean? I don't know what they mean Translate. by that. It's it's their own. <laughs> they have their own like way of life, their own vibe, their own style. Uh, you will see bumper stickers that say "Keep Midtown Janky." Um, it's <laughs> it's it's different. It is different. Like if you go there, it's like no place you've ever been. Um, okay, so you you know it when you feel it. Yeah, yeah. You're like, you're like if you just look around at first, like there really isn't that much different. Then you start noticing the details. And you're like, okay, this is actually pretty cool. Like there's all these hidden murals, for example, throughout Midtown. Okay. There's hidden murals. You'll go walking by this bookstore. It looks like this regular old bookstore. But then you'll notice little tiny goblin heads along the bottom. You know, just it is just the weirdest stuff at the weirdest places. It's just the way that it, it is. And everybody's actually pretty cool. So. I was going to say, but it I sounds quite, live there. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds quite artistic as well. Oh, it's that, yeah. Midtown's a very artist area. Um, they yeah. have every year they have a. Mm sidewalk chalk drawing competition um that there's some amazing mm. chalk work <laughs> let's mo- keep midtown janky meaning let's keep midtown real preserving the historic past stop building hideous retail shops that do not go with the facade of the old buildings in the area yep. i mid- had to look it up i was curious <laughs> <laughs> midtown also isn't that far from because, old town uh, okay, because so this, like, in- kind of an- there's an authenticity oh. they're trying to yeah. maintain there. Yeah. Yeah. I like, had to look it up because in, in my in my head, janky means old and run down. Uh, like that's what the slang meaning of the word is. So I was like, why would they want to keep a place old and run down? But they don't mean it like that. No, so. they don't mean it like that. <laughs> no, it's I had to I mean if there's like this one company, they they opened a club in Old Town and they painted over a historic like business name, like that was there from when Sacramento was first founded. Man, they almost got run out of town with torches and pitchforks. <laughs> it's like there's like you'll that's like California is pretty progressive, pretty liberal, but you screw with our history, 
we will go Wild West in a heartbeat. <laughs> so I gotta I ask. Kinda... You, I gotta ask yeah. you because I've I've yeah. heard this from a lot of people. Like I've I've as you notice, I'm active on Reddit. <laughs> I'm usually out. I'm usually trolling and picking fights. I have to admit, I am. But I'm also <laughs> very supportive in a lot of other areas. And there was this one area. It was an Ask Reddit, and they asked for people not from the U.S. What was the most surprising part about coming to the U.S.? And the one theme that really came through is that we are a nation of extreme. We are extremely kind. We are extremely selfish. We are extremely thoughtful. We are extremely mindless. We are ex- we just don't know middle <laughs> ground. Either we don't drink or we're drunk 24-7. <laughs> like there is no middle ground with us. What was your experience like? What, how, how was it for you? What surprised you? That's really interesting. That I mean, and that definitely rings true, actually, for me. Not to not to jump on that as as being the answer, but it it, it definitely, yeah, that rings true for me because I found, I suppose, I found Americans very um, extremely friendly and extremely gregarious, and you know, any Americans that we meet over here are very um, very outgoing and very just just very um, what's the word. Yeah, kind of, um, I would say, up, not upbeat is probably putting, makes it sound very blunt. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Cause I, I think that the, 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 the nuance that you get from sort of maybe being a smaller country, like, like we are, that, that wasn't my experience of, of being in, in the States anyway. There was, there was, as you say, a lot of extremes, a lot of everything was bigger. Everything was more convenient. Everything was like, you know, in every possible way, I think, bar a couple of, of sort of strange exceptions, everything was way more technologically advanced. I, I kind of felt like a lot of the time, again, for me, somebody who's grown up in Ireland, we get a lot of American TV shows and films and things. A lot of the time I felt like I was on kind of a film set. There was a sense of sort of surrealness about it, which I which I found a bit odd at times. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, there was there was this kind of thing of like, am I really here in, in the, you know, I remember going to New York. <laughs> And uh, and just kind of wandering around, just being like everything seems sort of familiar, but also really alien. Um, so let me guess. Yeah, the Boston accent. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, well, it was it was weird as well in Boston because it was like when you go to somewhere like Southie, you're kind of seeing like the extreme end of the Irish. It was like the Irish that you have here amped up especially that kind of around the St. Patrick's Day thing there was like I remember walking around and just thinking the people's faces looked familiar in a way that was like you know there was something genetically very familiar about them but everything was just like maxed out and everybody was going nuts in a way that even we are not capable of over here um oh yeah Irish pride across the entire U.S. is unreal like you know who the Irish are come (laughs) St. Patrick's Day they do yeah. not make it, it buzz about it. They are like, I am Irish. I'm proud. And they're decked out head to toe green. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was something else. Yeah. And and not even just on St. Patrick's Day. It was like people were so... Actually, that was one thing that really su- surprised me. I kind of heard that before I go over that. You know, people really like the Irish over there. But it was like full on. I mean, everybody is very... Um, is very kind of immediately warm to you when they realize... I think sometimes there was kind of a, a thing of like are you English or are you Scottish or, oh, you're Irish. Then it was like, oh, you kind of, that, that was great. But, um, so, hey, listen, yeah, it listen was... to the R's. That's the giveaway yeah. for me for listen for the Irish accent. Yeah. I grew up Catholic and every mm. priest I had was Irish. So I grew up with that. Right. Yeah. And I mean, from Ireland had the okay. accent out in this little podunk town in Northern California about, you know, opposite end of the globe <laughs> away. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I didn't realize they were still kind of shipping them out over there. Do you? Yeah, I was, <laughs> yeah and, um, and we had uh, Father O'Malley, Father Riley. Uh, and I can't remember who was the one that actually baptized me, but Father Riley was the one that was my personal favorite. Um, yeah, I actually was an altar boy for a little bit too because of him. Right. He was just so cool. <laughs> that's. I mean, that's. It's. It's kind of surprising in a sense to hear somebody with a sort of a positive. Um, spin on that to, to be honest I suppose there's, we get we have a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, 
stuff over here at the moment about the kind of the the abuse. Um, yeah, kind the, of a lot of it is. I think it's pretty global. Abuse in the Catholic Church. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and and in Ireland, a lot of it kind of coming out is is um, around you know these mother and baby homes and um, and sexual sexual abuse of, for children in, in mm. kind of institutional care and things like that. And <laughs> there was a, there was a kind of a revelation a couple of years ago that they were that we were sort of shipping some of the paedophile priests and, and things like this over to other places to kind of like just put them somewhere else. So to well, hear somebody, nothing bad hear, happened hear, for me. So. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's actually it's quite it's quite refreshing um, because in a lot of ways, I suppose you know we we if they're kind of some sort of ambassadors for our country, we want to make sure that um, that that they weren't all just yeah. Of um, course, I have some real off color jokes that are just dying to come out. I'm like, not mm-mm, don't do it. Nope. <laughs> I won't be the After, yeah. probably. No, no. After the podcast, sure, I will go ahead and fire yeah. him off. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, mm-mm, mm-mm. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, some of the stuff about, it, about the states that I found weird was probably on the smaller scale. It was like when I say things about the, the technology. There was like certain things surprised me. So some things were so convenient, like the the card for the subway was like like I don't think I think we're just starting to have stuff like that in Ireland for like getting on and off public transport where you have like kind of a swipe card, and it was just so normal. Then there was things like, um, you know, all of the the sockets for uh, for like electrical cables were outside of the house, um, it, where I was living anyway, and I quite it seemed to be sort of like exposed weather wise. There didn't seem to be a lot of. It was like there was a sense of just that's good enough. Just leave that as is, and you know there was a like there was a the laundry bit of, in our house was in the basement. Again, it just seemed to me to kind of be like a total fire hazard, but it was like. That works fine enough. Just leave that as it is. And then there oh, was with, stuff like with um, our fire codes that we have. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah. Of course, unless um, they did it without having an inspection, then it could be a problem. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, and yeah, and then really super tiny things that just struck me as weird as well. It was like we were trying to buy a, a kettle. Do you know, like a kettle for boiling water? Um, mm-hmm. So we here again. We live on tea, so it's so normal to have one that's plugged in to the wall, like an electrical one. Over there, I remember we had this thing that you put on the, the stove top that you have to light and it whistles and it just seemed like I was going back in time and in some I ways. have one of those. Um, <laughs> I love those. We have one too. <laughs> oh, I find that so I, strange. But that's we don't, how I make my tea. Uh, I, I don't I only drink iced tea uh, and sun tea. Oh, so you don't even need it. Yeah, but we use it to for oatmeal. You get the water hot. <laughs> Yeah. Oh no! I use it to boil my water to make my iced tea. Oh, you know what my dad started doing again? Percolated coffee, and I gotta say, so much better than drip. So much better. Hmm. Yeah, it's like here in that's, the states, um, we're more about our coffee than we are about tea. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's the message I got. I got yeah, very much. It was like it's just not really a concern. Um, I remember trying to buy as well something over there. I, I don't know. It's like a hot water bottle. Was what I have one here. It's like um, you know, a hot water bottle. You know, oh, like those of, red um... rubber. Yeah, and yeah. The, the way you describe it is like so. Like I have one here that's got like a, a case on yeah. it, so kind of a furry case. Yeah, I mm-hmm. couldn't find one for love and money in in. I couldn't even tell Cambridge you where to get one. When I was trying to buy one. I couldn't tell you where right? to find one, and I'm over like, over here you can buy them. Yeah, you can buy them everywhere. You could buy it in the pharmacy. You could buy it in the supermarket. They are everywhere. I remember trying to buy one and I was in somewhere in, in the Cambridge Site Galleria just asking them, like, you know, I'm looking for a hot water bottle. And they were directing me to kind of like, you know, a flask for like keeping water hot to drink. Yeah, kind of or... like an actual water <laughs> bottle. Yeah. I was like, no, <laughs> what? Um, and again, it was just, it was so strange to me that that didn't make it or, or that there was somehow it wasn't needed. Um, and the other thing then cat, was cat throughout the answer. So we're, Amazon, <laughs> Amazon nine ninety nine. Yeah. I'm looking yeah, at that, right that now. Was a <laughs> of yeah. Oh my god, they have yeah. one that has a penguin on the cover. Oh my god, I have to have that. <laughs> Bexy loves penguins. Sorry. <laughs> um, the other thing was the food. Actually, that was the thing that really struck me about the states was, was the food. Um, because I, again, coming from here, we're very. Um, we sort of have a limited enough range of, of different other cultures influencing what we eat here. You know, we'd, we'd have, there'd be like Indian restaurants in Ireland and Thai and Chinese. It's probably about the extent of it. 
but then in the states it was like you know on the block where i was there was like a greek restaurant there was an afghan restaurant there was a tibetan restaurant it was just amazing i found that just um phenomenal in terms of just being able to um experiment with different things and i'm not a very experimental eater um and also i suppose it was uh but, but the thing that i found that was missing for me was so we like we like having so eat fries is, is what you call them we call them chips but potato you know fries. yeah yeah um yeah so we have we have we have chippers here which is like a kind of a scottish irish british thing i think probably um mm-hmm. it's also italian but anyway um where you get a bag of chips and it's like these really thick cut fries load of salt and vinegar and they're in a paper bag and i couldn't find that in america um at all i could find the the skinny cut fries and you could find like you could get a plate of fries in a restaurant but you couldn't get this kind of like chipper chips and i was thinking with all of the sort of the the waves of uh immigration that that have happened over there and especially from people like the irish and the scottish oh and the, the italians i'm looking at pictures <laughs> of it right now for the chipper chips we yeah we have those. Have, you just got to know where to go steak fries so maybe that's yeah, steak it. fries I didn't know where to go yeah, you have to steak you have to order fries. steak fries in America to get those thick, thick cut. Uh, yeah, at first I was fries. sitting there going, "Are you talking about what we call JoJo's or potato wedges?" Oh wait, no, no steak no, fries. No steak fries. Do they come in a paper bag that's like you know sort of half falling no. apart with no. all the vinegar? Well, I mean, <laughs> you could go to you like could... say Red Robin and probably buy a bag of because yeah. their their fries are steak fries. Yes. And, oh, they're so good. <laughs> like Red Robin, yeah, they're so like. Okay, so I got to ask, did you try our beef? I don't think I, I'm not, a, I wasn't, I, I, at the moment, I'm, I don't eat any meat at all. And at the okay. time, I definitely probably wasn't. So I don't think, I might have it's, had a burger somewhere. It's like everybody <laughs> I've talked to that's, that has come here and had our beef, they're just like, it doesn't matter what country they're from. They're like, your beef is so good. <laughs> it's like, the, oh, we are, okay. it's a, it's a, it gets a source of pride. Like, I had an Australian come over and she's like, I came over, I decided to try one of your burgers, and it tasted better than our, our steaks. Wow. <laughs> and she's like, then I had to go for a steak. We know beef. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, Betsy's in Beefville, USA. She lives in Texas. <laughs> that I am. Oh, yeah, of course. And then there's the big <laughs> fight over, like, who has the best, like, steaks. So you have your fights over Omaha steaks. You have your fights over the Texas-type steaks. Oklahoma's like, don't leave us out. Everybody fights over who has the best steaks. Same with chili. Yeah, this, it's like a regional pride thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, same with barbecue. Uh, and barbecue, barbecue sauce. And barbecue sauce. Like, hey, there's, you have different types. Like, if it's a molasses based sauce, that's like a Kansas City sauce. <laughs> you know, there's, it is crazy the amount of fighting. It's like, I'm on the coast, so I don't get exposed to that so much. I just yeah. get to go. Everybody else is like, oh, my burger's the best. My burger's the best. I'm like, you guys don't have In-N-Out. You don't know. Bexy's had In-N-Out, In-N-Out now. I have In-N-Out. <laughs> and it's amazing. I have, it is. I have In-N-Out, but I also have Whataburger, and I like them both. Yeah, you can like them both. Oh, but I've, yeah. yeah, I've been to Whataburger. I think, yeah, there was one in Boston. I, I can't remember what I had. And then there's also... But I definitely have been to it. It's like, familiar. everyone's like, uh, over the East Coast, is all about White Castle. I've had White Castle, too, because... I'm I'm from the north originally, so yeah. The only White Castle we get are the frozen ones, and I and they taste like poo. <laughs> I'm like I'm like man, they're if not this, good. yeah, I was like this cannot be what they're going crazy over. It's Although, not. if you want a big East Coast West Coast fight, pizza that will always cause a fight. Always. <laughs> that's that's tribal, is it? Oh, very. It's like you know I. <laughs> Although I have had some people from New York come over and say that, yeah, your pizza's good. <laughs> it's like, mm. you, you can't just do your traditional, like, pepperoni pizza. Mm. You gotta do what the restaurant specializes in. Uh, and it's yeah. gonna be different. I remember having the deep oh. dish in Chicago and liking that a lot. Because I, I like the bread part of the pizza. I'm like, if the base is good, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. That's um, actually, but, I worked at a round table. You had to have worked there for yeah. seven years and proven yourself to be able to do the crusts because the crusts make or break the pizza. And ever since then, I, it's mm-hmm. true. You can have the best toppings in the world, great sauce, great cheese. If that crust is crap, that's the first thing that touches your tongue. <laughs> so, 
absolutely yeah yeah and you can so, have a great crust with crappy ingredients it's still a better pizza than a great ingredients on a crappy crust yeah no I, I totally agree yeah I think we're um I think again we just we have such a limited range of, of things like that here it's it's just when I went there the options for everything was was extreme and, and overwhelming it was like I, I couldn't kind of wrap my head around it at times um but yeah and then I've had people I remember Amer- an American saying to me before you know oh the, the food is really bland in Ireland and um and just be really like affronted by that I was like well, we don't really have like you know a national cuisine I suppose but we have a lot of we tend to sort of like make a lot of ingredients for things so like you know we do um we do we do the components of a dish pretty well we might not <laughs> we might then make a mess of it kind of you know by the time you, you will we'll overcook whatever it is or boil the death out of it but um but the our, our ingredients i think are, are still pretty strong um i do love me was... some cabbage <laughs> do you yeah yeah i do that's uh i i grew up eating corned beef and cabbage i yeah I, oh yeah that's so cor- good. corned beef like if there's a slab of it sitting down i'll just grab it and just <laughs> gnaw on it i love it <laughs> so good um you know that actually in the united states haggis is illegal is it yes is it why? I don't remember well, exactly is, why, is. but it's illegal. And I'm like, I want to try it. I know it's like most people would like if they saw what's in it, they'd be like, Bleh. I'm like, I want to try it. Worst thing that could happen mm-hmm. is I don't like it. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's, I've tried alligator. I've are... tried can- I've tried uh, rattlesnake. I've tried escargot. I, I'll try I anything. Think people are way too squeamish about it just because of what goes into it. But I mean. Honestly, people eat the, you know, the innards of animals like that. I mean, you call it a sweet bread and people are going to eat it up. But yeah. Yep. You know, yeah, don't call it what it is. Yeah. It's like, yeah, no. we, we have a lot of um We make a lot of those. I think you call them blood puddings. We call them black pudding. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That's like a real Irish thing. The black pudding and the white pudding. And then we have things like the. You know, it's like the sheep's stomach and stuff like that, but it's not called that. None of those are called what they what they actually are. <laughs> yeah. um, the way I got um, like my friends and family uh, to try mm-hmm. stuff that they normally wouldn't try, get them a soup from Mexico called Menudo. <laughs> it has oh my god, Menudo is so good. It is. It's it's all those little bits and stuff of like beef that you that you normally don't eat in the states because yeah. usually it's all about you know all the different steak cuts and burger cuts, but. Like the stomach, the tongue, and all that gets tossed. Well, no, that's in menudo. <laughs> and I think Caesar well, tried to say something a few times, but mm-hmm. it's okay, so I dark, I, I just see it light up. And... <laughs> <laughs> Did you have something to say, C? No, no I'm just laughing. Oh, okay. um... <laughs> Can you believe that we've been doing this now for almost two hours and 40 minutes? Oh my goodness, I didn't yes. even notice that. <laughs> it's almost time and for I you to get up. Now it's... <laughs> I know. I'm like, yeah, I'm in a meeting at nine. Let me guess, you didn't feel it until I said something. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. And no, this, I'm like, oh. this episode's had really good energy. It really has. It has. Yeah. It does. Oh, it's no, really I, nice. I enjoyed this a lot. Um, as I say, it's just so nice and it's refreshing to have these kind of conversations with people. So I'm. I really welcome it in any shape or form. So it's, it's been, uh, yeah, it's been really, really enjoyable. Yeah, and, and go ahead and you know, keep in contact. Uh, if you want to get on the discord, absolutely, it will start getting more popular. Yeah, I, I will. Bexy's finally figuring it out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. The only thing I can't do is tune in live to you guys. Cause it, well, unless I end up staying up all night sometime anyway, if I find myself up late on a Thursday night, at some point and I'm, I'm like oh you know they kick off at two o'clock i could probably i could probably dial in <laughs> but i'll have to it'll have to be listening back mostly i think for me yeah, if you have like friday yeah, off that's all right though yeah exactly exactly of course yeah. you know get some of yeah, your friends be like hey check this out <laughs> yeah it'd be like i yeah, was yeah, on it's like that. the end of <laughs> yeah actually that would be quite cool I mean, you kind of two o'clock is like the time of the night where you might if you were out for the night you might come home so it's like you know if there was if there was a couple of people around. Yeah, two in the morning strange. here. It's closing time. Bars close up. No alcohol sales yeah. until six a.m. So there's that four-hour window where you're not allowed to buy alcohol. 
as if people don't stock up. Oh, no. I don't get it. Exactly. <laughs> and you can can't they open buy- at six a.m. They can open it. There are. I know some bars that open at six a.m. because there's people that work graveyard shifts. When they get off, oh, that's yeah. the end of their day, and they might want to go out and drink oh, a little yeah. bit. And then, of course, you're, that makes sense. you also yeah. can't buy lottery tickets until six a.m. from four from two to six. I'm just like, what? Like, why? Is- <laughs> what? That doesn't make any yeah. sense. Like between those areas, you just cannot be trusted to to help. As in, like you just can't be trusted with anything, is it? Basically, according to, I, I think it's all because according to how I met your mother, nothing good happens after two a.m. <laughs> or before six. You know that is pretty true, though. No, yeah, so, I think that um, so. Ka- Ka- you can make some of the you can make some bad decisions, I suspect, between two and six. But I don't know if lottery tickets are really the the worst thing you could be. You and honestly, the bad with. decisions between two and six are usually really fun. <laughs> <laughs> you wind up paying for them, but they're really fun. <laughs> yeah. And Kat just said that she has to go. It's been a great episode. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ava. Thank right. you, Kat. Yes. Kat has been one of the most loyal listeners yes. um, mm-hmm. by far. Same with Deverne. I'm a little disappointed that that was all that yeah. was in the chat today. But we're opening up. It's summertime. I'm not too surprised that the listener listening is down a little bit right now. It's expected. We've been locked up yeah. for a year. Exactly. <laughs> we're on. And if you're archiving all of the episodes, then people can tune in. You know, people can can kind of yeah uh, uncover oh, and, this anytime. And, and we're we're published on a ton of places. Yeah, we're so, on yeah. Apple. Yeah. We're on Google. We're on Amazon. Mm-hmm. We're on iHeartRadio. Uh, Spotify, Spotify, we're everywhere. YouTube, yep. yeah, even I the get, use of the tube. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're on YouTube as well. Yeah, but we have so little listenership I there. I can't get a cost of you all. Oh, are we gone? Okay, I was going to say I get you guys on um, Podcast Addict, and they have. You're the that, one. That's where I've been able yes. to stream it from anyway. Yeah, yeah actually, we pushed directly. I'm the one, yeah. No, we actually pushed directly to uh, <laughs> Podcast Addict. Like, as soon as the episodes are done, oh, okay. Spreaker <laughs> automatically, I, I have that synced up. I have to, I'm actually in the process right now of being approved to be put onto Audible. So oh, we, we are hopefully will be on Audible soon. Wow. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, it looks like Aud- quite reach, Audible yeah. is entering into the podcast arena. So Great. yeah, I put in. Uh, awesome. when I, exciting. I put in as an early interest. So yeah, when it, they just messaged me saying, "Hey, we are going to go ahead and do this now." So I'm like, "Apply, mm-hmm. apply, apply, apply." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. I really like. I I kind of wish you nothing but the best, really, because I think it's um, yeah, what you're doing is is just, and you're giving up so much of your of your time. You know, I mean, I'm I'm doing this one off but you guys are, are doing this every week it's it's a real commitment it's um it is yeah and it's a it's a real service to people so it's it's and it's very admirable i think not gonna lie it was a lot more work than i thought it was going to be yeah but i, I wouldn't stop i, I can't stop i mm-hmm. love this too much uh and it's not even that there are people out there that do depend on this and it's not even that the fact that we have had a, a couple of people now that have admitted that they are still here because of this podcast I'm just doing it because I feel a great sense of accomplishment with it. You know, this yeah. is this is therapeutic yeah. for me too. Yeah, yeah, I could really understand that. Yeah, and it's like you know, hearing other people's stories, sharing bits of my story, even having episodes that we dedicate to ourselves and share. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very therapeutic, and I'm sure that yeah. you're going to feel. A little, I mean, you probably feel a little bit of a buzz from this. Oh, definitely. I think I'm probably going to have trouble falling back asleep for sure. You're, you're going to carry um, this buzz probably for a couple of days. It, yeah, it happens. Yeah. So That's yeah, good. let's go ahead and uh, wrap you. this up. I do have that joke I want to drop afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> we'll st- stay tuned for that. <laughs> but for everybody else, if you like what you heard, please like the episode, follow us, um, share it with others. You know, especially anybody that you think that the episode will resonate with, or other episodes. Um, and if you want to help us out further, you can always donate by going to um, I, amimental.net slash donate. We have a number of ways that we can accept uh, donations. And yes, we do accept foreign currency because we use 
Libra Pay, which is f- actually based in France. So that's awesome. So we can get that help there. And if you want to buy some uh, some swag, like a T-shirt that says it's okay to be okay or whatnot, or a tote bag that Kat used going to the store, she said. Uh, yeah. yeah, I saw that. We do have a spring tea, a Teespring store as well. But until next week, I'm E. And I'm Bexie, and I'm begging whoever's in Auckland, New Zealand listening to get in the chat. <laughs> Come on, Come see. see. <laughs> uh, bye. 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 see.